Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of April 16th, 2015. Um, City Councilor uh, Bill Dwight. That's right, I had to check that. Um, I'm the uh, president and I'll be presiding tonight. Um, as is our custom, we will open with uh, public comment. Uh, public is invited to speak, <coughs> excuse me, on any topic, um, uh, keeping their comments to under three minutes. Uh, also acknowledging and recognizing and conforming to the decorum of the chamber. And um, when you, when I call your name, if you please come up and state, restate your name and basically correct my pronunciation. And then uh, tell us your address. And then you can proceed to talk. So first up, uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, is this Thomas Bradberg? See, that, I'm glad I had you do that. <laughs> and what's your address? Uh, hi, I'm Thomas Bradbury, 99 Federal Street in Florence. Thank you. Um, I'm here about the ordinance pertaining to the ban of single-use plastic bags. So to the City Council of Northampton. Hello, my name is Thomas Bradbury. I reside at 99 Federal Street, Florence, Mass. I am the store operations manager at River Valley Market, 330 North King Street, Northampton. I'm here to read this letter tonight to the City Council during the public comments. Our Communities Co-op Incorporated is Northampton Community Cooperative Market Incorporated doing business as River Valley Market LLC does not use plastic bags for grocery bagging at the register. We have eliminated all plastic clamshells and other plastics that cannot be recycled from our fresh foods and prepared foods packaging. We have recently fine-tuned this using the town of Brookline, Massachusetts new ordinance as guidance. We have also asked our vendors to discontinue use of certain plastics using the Brooklyn Ordinance as guidance. Now, River, Val River Valley Market does support the ban on plastic bags for bagging groceries at the register. We have been in business in Northampton for seven years and have never had them and will not. We also are hopeful that bags used to bag produce and bulk items will soon be compostable, biodegradable, or recyclable in the near future. Our community-owned food co-op has a triple bottom line, profit, people, and planet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up, um, Mac, you're up, but you know, of course, you get the, you have the floor for a whole period, so. Right, no, I just want to express my gratitude on 40 Valley Street. I want to express my gratitude to River Valley Market and Cereos, and also, in particular, to the counselors who played a, a leadership role in working on the plastic bag ban. I think it's really time to do this. I think uh, there's never gonna be a better time, so thanks to all that have been involved in that effort. Thank you. And, and by the way, smack effort, just so for the public record. Um, Jody Young, please. Hi. I would also like to um, voice my support for the plastic bag ban, and I come with some visuals to support that. I lived in um, Los Angeles, California, Portland, Oregon, and Austin, Texas, prior to moving here four years ago. And all of those cities I was able to participate in and witness efforts to ban the plastic bag, and they were all successful, by the way. And I saw some really good um, public awareness efforts, and I just wanted to, if I could pass these around. Oh, please, yeah. Show you some visuals, because I think they really go a long way in supporting and helping the community. Oops. Thanks. 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 And this was, I'm not a professional designer, and I wanted to volunteer my efforts to craft, create a campaign. You Very good, thank you. Thank you. Here, this is actually for the camera. There we go. Um, and Catherine Morris, please. Um, I'm just going to read a very brief letter. And, and Catherine, I'm sorry, can you? Um, state your address too. I'm oh, sorry. Catherine Marsh, 9 Prospect Heights, Northampton. Um, and it's about overuse of pesticides in my neighborhood off of Jackson Street, up Jackson Street, right near the school. And I'll just read this briefly. I, I may cut some of it out. The, the spraying of synthetic pesticides on trees and lawns is known to be dangerous to humans and animals. Cancer hospitals such as Sloan Kettering have long warned of the dangers of pesticides. 
This exposure is cumulative and cause, can cause cancer, damage to neonatal development, endocrine disruptors, and possibly Parkinson's disease. Neighbors are often not notified and passers-by, including young children on the way to the Jackson Street School, are in danger of chemical exposure, and I've seen it from my house on Prospect Heights. Residents of this very thickly settled neighborhood are also being exposed to chemicals which are not yet proven safe. And they can get in the drinking water. We all want to protect our trees and lawns, but is spraying dangerous chemicals into urban neighborhoods really the best or even acceptable way to do this? Many state agricultural agencies recommend elimination or minimalization of synthetic pesticides. We suggest that we suspend, although we can't because I've, I've learned from looking on the internet all weekend that we can't stop someone from what they do to their own property, but we can raise consciousness. And we can talk about it. We can put up these things. We can distribute these New York Times things. Pass them on, please. In the past, the American Lung Association has given Hampshire County failing smog grades. Do we really want to add more chemicals to this already dangerous level of pollution? We are deeply concerned about protecting the most vulnerable who do not have a voice. Are we going to believe the pesticide companies or Sloan Kettering Hospital? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's all we have signed up for. Is anyone else interested in speaking at this time? Okay, going once, going twice. Roll call, please. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Shera. Here. Councilor Spector. Here. We have a quorum with one absent. Um, and Councilor Adams tonight will be serving as the uh, chair of finance uh, in Council Murphy's absence. First up, scheduled at 7.05, so we're five minutes late, but it's a public hearing regarding a poll petition received from National Grid. Um, and I'll accept a motion to open the hearing. So Make a motion. All of those in favor of open the hearing, please say aye. 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 Um, I would be interested in hearing from the opponent, Lisa, if you want to come up and talk. Thank you. <coughs> Right. Members of the Council, Lisa Jasinski with National Grid. We are requesting permission to install underground cables on Elm Street from the corner of West Street, approximately 300 feet up Elm Street on the west side of the street. Um, it would be removing a couple of poles with secondary cables, which are low voltage cables, and installing them underground. It is for a project that Smith College is going to be doing in front of the college there. We also will be, I'm sorry, I think that it's on the sketch too. We will also be crossing the street over to a street light pole that's to the right of St. Mary's as you're looking at it. Um, before we get to questions, I was wondering, are there any opponents or any other proponents? I thought not. So, um, counselors, any questions about this project? I, I, I have a question about, uh, more generically, about, I, I and this is not relevant to this necessarily, okay. but the, the running underground cables, of course, has also been, has been a debate around this region for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, the liability of poles, and it's always been appealing the prospect of running, but it's wires underground, um, but it's always been considered to be cost prohibitive, among other things. Mm -hmm. Is this is this an indication of a trend, or is this as opposed to going across the street with a pole, or is this uh, is this an experiment, or is this just well, it's not really an experiment, and it's certainly not a trend, but it is at the request of a customer who actually absorbs the cost of the work that's being done. So it's you know cost prohibitive. It would be you know I can't even imagine you know the numbers thinking about putting poles and wires underground. It all if you're talking about all of them. I know that in a lot of areas and a lot of developments it's requested that right. it's all underground and, and that's terrific. I think it's nice that it is that way, but to um, to you know put all of our utilities underground in, in crowded streets as they are sometimes is very difficult along with the cost. Uh, Councilor Carr. Um, so you did say that this is for the low voltage cables? It is. They're secondary cables. They feed street lights and a couple of traffic signals, which there will be, you know. And while they're at it, then my question is, do you know, since they'll 
already be digging, will they go ahead and run additional conduit for any future use for the high voltage? Uh, no, you know, we had actually petitioned the city some t some years ago, it was quite a few years ago, to actually install high voltage and just around that corner and connect a couple of, of feeders is what we call them. They're, you know, just how they, they go out into the, you know, the neighborhoods to distribute the energy. but. Um, it's determined that the way it's all set up now, there's no need for that anymore. Sometimes we, you know, if when something goes out, we backfeed it with, you know, other um, or other sources, and th that no longer is deemed necessary, so they won't. Okay. And uh, one more, Joe. The time frame. When do you expect this, this work would start? Well, it won't be until after graduation. I think the request is sometime after Memorial Day. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Councilor Labarge. Also looking at the language that has been proposed by the Board of Public Works, they are recommending exactly what they have asked you to do, which is that they are asking you to make sure that you cross Elm Street with cross city owned water, sewer and drain mains, which are five to six feet deep at gas mains. Based on that information, they recommend that the handholds and the conduit be at least then three feet from the edge of the road. So if you didn't get that information, you wouldn't be able to do it, correct? Uh, yeah, I actually have not seen that, and and that's fine. That's something that you know we work out with the you know Board of Public Works. You know, I do know that there's going to be there's a sidewalk um, along that way, and I believe it's there's going to be a retaining wall of some sort. I don't know, and I'll have to address that with the Board of Public Works because I don't know if that gets these handholes actually three feet off. So that will have to be worked out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? I'll accept the motion to close the hearing. Make a motion. Uh, all those in favor close the hearing, please say aye. 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 I'll accept a motion for approval. Move to approval. approval. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> um, now we come to the communications from the mayor. The mayor is here. Prepared to communicate. Good evening, counselors. I actually have one um, uh, proclamation that I'd like to issue this evening, uh, and it actually uh, directly affects uh, one of our city departments. Um, it is uh, entitled Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, April 13th through the 19th of 2015. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time which require the prompt response of police officers, firefighters, and paramedics in order to protect life and preserve property. And whereas the safety of our police officers and firefighters is dependent <coughs> on the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone the Public Safety Communications Center, and whereas public safety dispatchers are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services and are a vital link for our police officers and firefighters, and whereas Northampton's 11 public safety dispatchers handle over 37,000 emergency and non-emergency calls last year for the city's police, fire, and emergency medical services, dispatch and coordinate our police officers, fire units, and ambulances, and maintain after-hours contact with the DPW, animal control, and all city buildings, and whereas each dispatcher has exhibited compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job over the past year, and whereas <coughs> Northampton public safety dispatchers play an active role in the development and training of new police officers, attend fire department training evolutions, and participate in the Citizens Police Academy. Now, therefore, I, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor of the City of Northampton, do hereby proclaim April 13th through the 19th, 2015, as National Telecommunicators Awareness Week to honor the dispatchers of Northampton Public Safety Communications Center for their constant devotion to public safety dispatching, consistent excellence in customer service, and the continued pursuit of the goal to protect life and property while maintaining the highest level of professionalism. In witness whereof I have set my hand and imprinted the seal of the city of Northampton, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, and I'll be um, I'll be presenting this to uh, Kelly Bannister and her staff over at the Dispatch Center. And I just wanted to um, this is a national week for uh, for telecommunicators and public safety, and so um, 
just wanted to make sure that we recognize our dispatchers during this time. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, we're up to one minute announcements. I, I know that, that uh, Council LaBarge has something queued up, so Council LaBarge. Yeah, I put one of these flyers on all the counselors' desks. Um, I received this. I went and picked up my ticket on Monday. The, it's a proceed for, and it's called Starry Night Auction. All the proceeds will benefit the RKFRR Ryan Road School PTO. And this will help pay for field trips, cultural events, and technology at Ryan Road Elementary School. This will occur on May 8th, 6.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the Look Park Garden House. The admission is $25 and dress code come as you are. The tickets are available at Ryan Road office or you can go online at www.brownpapertickets.com. And I went last year and it was wonderful and it was a great benefit. So if you counselors are available, I would love to have you there. Thank you very much. Are there any other one-minute announcements? Councilor Adams. Northampton Senior Services and Senior Center will be hosting its 13th annual Health and Safety Fair on Thursday, May 7th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Senior Center at 67 Con Street. And it'll be a free event sponsored for senior citizens, their families, and the community. And there'll be demonstrations, displays, and information, and lunch will be served in Mary's Bistro from 11 to 1.30. Everyone's invited. Councilor O'Donnell. Thank you. On Monday, April 27th, um, at 7 p.m. at Bridge Street School, uh, there will be a presentation um, slash forum. Uh, I believe it's put on mainly by the League of Women Voters, but we'll feature um, Superintendent John Provost to discuss um, public education funding uh, generally, um, especially in light of um, declining state aid for our schools. So it's a chance to come and, and ask questions and learn about this, which is very important in the city. So again, it's Monday, April 27th at 7 p.m. at Bridgeview. Any other announcements? Okay. Well, now we're moving up to the resolution to adopt the capital improvement program. FY 2016 to FY 2020, as submitted by Mayor Narkworth on March 2nd, 2015. This is the second reading. Um, and I'm going to read the resolution. It's it, very brief. So uh, uh, the City Council hereby adopts the Capital Improvement Pro Program FY 2016 to FY 2020, submitted by the Mayor on March 2nd, 2016, in accordance with the Charter of Northampton. And that's in Massachusetts for those of you looking for it. Article 7, Finance and Fiscal Procedures, Section 7-5, Capital Improvement Program. I'll set the motion. Okay. Further discussion on this? On uh, this is, as I said, it's the second reading. No? <coughs> Ready? Roll call, please. Councilor Carney. This is yes, this, okay, I'm sorry, I, was, uh, I just was just a You were in another meeting. Question. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> yes, you, yes, I do approve of okay, the, okay. the, uh, the capital, capital improvement plan. Excellent, good news. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Uh, it passes. Uh, so that passes in second reading, and that has been approved. And now, <laughs> minus the drum roll, we have a presentation. Uh, this is the re reuse center opening. We have Roe Schmidt and Mac Everett here to make their case. And they've been kind enough to give us a PowerPoint presentation. So, <laughs> and, and I was telling Roe that soon the council chambers are going to be retrofitted to provide better audio visual aids, but right now we have to resort to the, the old school project, re, screen projection, which should suit you fine, but. We're happy, and when you're done with it, you can bring it up. We'll bring it up to the reuse committee, okay. And Perfect. I have to apologize, because I passed out a document to you all that's very hard to read, and in fact, a second version has arrived that's easier to read, so I'm just gonna pass a stack <coughs> over here, and you can all take that and recycle another one, if you like, that would be great. Um, okay. Yeah. 
Well, good evening. We're here tonight to celebrate the opening of the Northampton Reese Center at 170 Glendale Road. We are the reuse committee of the Commission of Public Works, formerly the Board of Public Works. The Reese Center has been evolving for many years. The BPW Reuse Committee ran into roadblocks because the Locust Street Transfer Station was just too busy to accommodate additional traffic. When former Mayor Higgins' Solid Waste Task Force recommended using or establishing a reuse center, the Glendale Road facility and the Glendale Road facility reduced its services. Opportunity was ripe to renovate the shed on Glendale Road for this purpose. Now it was possible to keep items from filling up the landfills. The nature of waste has well, changed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You should be able to control the mouse. Okay. Okay. And just click the left side. Okay. Oh, the left side. Okay. Cool. Okay. The nature of waste has changed in volume and composition over the last century. Land values have increased. Negative externalities of landfills, such as odor, have made waste a political and social challenge. <clears throat> Modifications of the amount of waste res uh, <clears throat> responds to these waste challenges. Zero waste is a concept to incorporate these new values. The reuse committee's goal is zero waste. This concept is hierarchical with reuse of materials trumping recycling. The intent is to keep as much material out of our landfill as possible. So you want to ref refuse what you don't need, reuse anything you can, reduce what you do need, recycle what you cannot refuse, reuse or reduce, and rot the rest or compost. Why aim for zero? Excess waste results in unsustainable resource mining, air and water pollution, increased energy consumption, public health concerns, and financial burden on local governments. Reuse items can be shared. The reuse, the Northampton's Reuse Committee has been holding events over the last 15 to 20 years. Marianne, you mentioned that one when we were talking earlier. But the committee felt that more could be done on a regular basis to keep items out of the landfill. These photos show the bulky, <coughs> rigid plastic swap and collection from 2012 and the tag sale from 2013. And this set of photos show the Kids Stuff and Art Materials event in 2013 and the Holiday Toy Swap in 2013 as well. And we're not completely abandoning reuse events. We've already scheduled the events for this year. Our first one will be the opening of the Reuse Center. <clears throat> The reuse committee was able to recruit a strong team of professional and seat of the pants volunteers. Northampton architect Tris Metcalf agreed to act as the architect and former BPW chair and Northampton city councilor Bob Reckman served as our ever patient general contractor and deconstruction professional Dave Giese who owns uh, Piece by Piece Deconstruction, a local business, volunteered his expertise as well. Electrician Tina Shea, carpenter Alex Gieslin, another former counselor, Central Services Warren Jones, and Jim Mayo, uh, Malo, excuse me, were also instrumental. The reuse committee from the Public Works Commission put together an industrious group of volunteers who gave up their Wednesdays and Saturdays to convert an old shed on Glendale Road. Alex Giesland took a few panels that needed special work back to his shop and then returned them chip shape. He also hung the front entry drawer. After some trenching to get water moving away from the building, workers build the form for a concrete sill. This was a really big project. <clears throat> reuse committee members worked second jobs as reuse center carpenters. Shelves and usable space emerged as Diana Riddle, Mac Everett, standing right here, Peter Racklebush, Alan Calhoun, David Shear, John Sass, and others put saw and screw gun to work. What else can a reuse committee do but reuse as many items as possible? Screws, doors, wood, and doorknobs were reused whenever possible, and salvaged paint from the Holyoke DPW paint project was used. Some new wood, paint, and concrete was purchased. 
Jerry Devine of Devine Overhead Doors proclaimed that the existing overhead door was still usable, and after volunteers refurbished the panels, he performed a professional installation. The reuse committee, with the help of a very supportive community, has transformed this worn out shed into a newly refurbished, a refurbished functional community space. The um, guiding principles for the uh, reuse group is based on zero waste. Zero waste means we will work to be a waste free in operation and will accept only items that are easily reusable and can be dismantled into recyclable parts if necessary. Zero cost means we won't accept items we'll have to pay to dispose of if no one wants them. If disposal fees apply to risky items, the fees must be paid before an item is accepted. Demand driven means we will accept what we will accept will evolve based on demand, popularity, and available alternative outlets. Problem solving means, when possible, we will help you find a way to reuse or repurpose your items. During uh, the winter, the committee concentrated on establishing policies and procedures to standardize the services provided by the reuse center. For example, some items in the center will be unable to uh, the center will be unable to accept because of their hazardous nature or lack of utility. Disposal fees will still apply according, according to um, DPW policies. And so this is an example of the items that we'll accept and items we can't accept. You have two examples of, of uh, a, a more lengthy um, detail. It will also be on the website for the DPW. Support reuse. Access to the reuse center may be obtained by the purchase of a transfer station permit at $25 with needs-based discounts applicable or a new reuse center sticker for $10. Our Facebook page has grown to over 1,200 followers. Once the reuse center is up and running, the reuse committee hopes to establish repair workshops and art workshops and a variety of other repurposing activities. In November 2014, our volunteers celebrated our progress. We had a working garage door, an attractive entry, and a roughed out interior space. But we're still looking for more volunteers, if you know anybody that's interested. So, do you have, have any questions? Questions? Uh, Councilor Klein? Um, you mentioned that there are certain things that you don't accept. I'm wondering if you have places that you can refer people to that do accept some of those things. Yeah, we, we're working to establish a network of end users. Those would be other organizations who might be interested in some of the materials we collect. For example, today I was on the phone with the Survival Center, and they said they would love to have any surplus children's books that we have. So we now know if somebody brings in a huge number of children's books that we have someone else that will take them if our customers don't take all of them. So those, those people we refer to as end users, and there's a number of organizations around the valley that we're inviting to, to let us know what kinds of things that they are looking for, whether it's durable medical supplies or stuff for kids or whatever. We are also going to have a, a big, a gigantic bullet board out there we'll, which will be divided into needs and leads. So. If someone has a particular need, they're looking for something, they can post it out there. Likewise, if someone has something that they would like to give away, especially something big that we don't necessarily want them to bring to the center. Like, let's say somebody has a piano. We don't want them to bring it to us because we only have 800 square feet of space out there. But we can put a note up that says, so-and-so um, has a piano. If you're looking for that, call that person directly, and hopefully that can happen with us facilitating, but not actually dealing with, <coughs> with the item. So those are two ways. Yeah. Councilor Klein. Thank you for all the work you've done on this. Um, on your Facebook page, yeah. do you expect that you might also be using that as a way, a kind of a virtual clearinghouse for letting people know items such as the piano or things? Yeah. Like we're, we're thinking about ways that we can do that. I know a lot of people would like us to do something electronic <coughs> that way, to, to have an online database. It's going to be a bit of a challenge because essentially it's going to be um, a first come, first serve operation. So 
people are interested in something, you know. And, and the other thing, of course, is it's a bit out of town, and some people are a little concerned about that. But our, we're we're delighted to have the space. Ned has been fantastic in terms of helping us get it renovated, and we hope it's the start of a lot of good things. I mean, right now we're really. Uh, the initial phase is this swap shop, this zero waste swap shop, but we're really hoping that we can go farther with it and have repair clinics and um, all, around the country there's a lot of uh, sh tool sharing and uh, make it and take it workshops, all kinds of things related to repurposing and we're hoping that uh, as the community learns about us and, and shows interest that we can do those kinds of things as well. But we're working on the, yeah, the <coughs> electronic piece, too. Yeah. And if I could just add to that, Susan Waite, our recycling coordinator, um, ha is working really hard to give Facebook a presence, but we want quick turnover of the items. So right. it may not be the best place to do it, but it's creating, um, I just, I mean, Jessica, I think, started the Facebook page. It sounds like you have over 12, you have 12, over almost 1,300. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, but it was like several years ago that we started it, mm -hmm. but it's only recently that it's uh, really been a uh, air communication yeah. vehicle. I think one of the other points that we've been trying to get across to people is that we realize we're, we're, we've got a learning curve to do here. We have to figure out what kind of stuff is the stuff that's really desirable that people really want, and then we can take lots of that kind of stuff. We know also that there's going to be stuff that nobody wants. And um, we're, in, you know, we have a special area for the arts, so we're encouraging artists to come out and help us come up with really creative ways to reuse stuff. If you've gone to our <coughs> Facebook page, there's lots of great examples of that. So, um, but, but there's going to be a, a learning process for us, and, and, uh, and the kinds of stuff that we can accept will change over time depending on what the demand is. So we ask people to be patient with us as we go through that learning process. And uh, well, just, uh, I just want to put up one other example. For example, as I look at that right now, and this was just posted yesterday, a local business is willing to give, it has approximately 25 um, used paper towel and soap dispensers. Right. So that might be something even someone would want to use for household use or swap. Yeah, that could be. And also, <laughs> there's actually a new, a new England regional website for businesses who have stuff like that to give away for free. So that would be another end user that we might, if, if we ended up with those and suddenly we had an excess and nobody wanted that, we know that we could post them out there mm -hmm. and make them available to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. That's great. Councilor Spector and then Councilor Carney. Just one, have you, do, do you know about Northampton Free Cycle, which is online? Yeah, and we're, we're encouraging people to use Free Cycle. Because I was thinking you could also post, if you got yeah. the piano, for example, right. you could post right. that. And, um, yeah, and Craigslist also has a free area. And also people, uh, there was a, a situation in my neighborhood recently where someone was going to give away a bedroom set. And that's really too big for us to take out there. But I posted it on my neighborhood listserv, and it was gone within 24 hours to a neighbor. So we're encouraging people, again, don't, don't think that it all has to happen out at our site. It can happen in these other decentralized ways as well. Any, any reuse is good as far as we're concerned. There's a Facebook page called Buy Nothing Northampton yeah. East Hampton right. as well, same thing. Right. Uh, Council Labarge. I want to thank you all been a long time. I do know way back, about 15 years ago, we worked with Karen Bacoyan very closely and the neighbors on Glendale Road. And at that point, they had made it the Dumpin' Donuts meetings that we had, which we all laughed about that name. And it was brought up many times of people coming in and exchanging, but we didn't have the area to do that. I, I, I'm so happy this is happening, and I thank you all for working tirelessly, and I think it will be a great success. My question is, I think you need to repeat the date again because there is some confusion yes. on that. Yes, we were made aware that there was an article that came out that said it was opening this Saturday, and it's Saturday the 25th. And the, the festivities will start at 9 o'clock that morning. Thank you. So thanks for reminding me. Yeah. Councilor Klein. 
I also want to just say thank you so much. I think this is incredible. Um, it's such an incredible resource for the city. And it's also really inspirational to see all of these volunteers that have come together and donated time and um, expertise. So that's really exciting. And I just wanted to ask one more thing. <clears throat> um, do you imagine there being, um, you having the ability to kind of go and pick things up from folks that may be older that don't have a way to get them to the site or they're volunteers that are willing to do that kind of provide that kind of service just to kind of um, assist all kinds yeah. of people who um, can we, it's a nice thought yeah we have <laughs> we have a, that capacity right at the moment but you know that's again going back to the neighborhood listserv thing we're hoping that people that there will be people in, in each neighborhood that are really excited about what we're doing and that they might be able to if to car to offer carpooling possibilities if there are people that don't have cars or like you say if they're aware of something we have that a neighbor might need and they're willing to help transport that that would be great um, you know again this depends a lot on the on the kind of response we get in terms of our volunteer network we're really looking for volunteers for helping to run the center on on the saturday mornings but we're also looking for people like that people who might be willing to do some transportation or we're also looking if you know people that like to tinker we've already roped in alex Giesler, and he's very good at this um, but people who like to fix things we're, ta we're taking in stuff right now we're taking in stuff that is is in working condition we'd like to be able to take in stuff that needs light repairs and that we can send to a woodworker or um, someone that likes to work on appliances or whatever. So we're really on the lookout for those sorts of people. And if you're aware of any of them in your constituencies, please tell them to get in touch with us. Uh, Councilor Shara and then Councilor Labarge. Um, I'm beyond excited, so thank you so much for this. Um, so the, the intake guidelines that you gave us, are those on the DPW website? Did you they say? are. Yeah, I, not yet, but they're, oh. they're going to go up? OK, great. I feel like I should be able to figure this out, but I'm failing at it. What does BB stand for on here? Bullet board. So if you see that, that means it's an item. Um, for example, I'm just, I'm just looking down here, and log splitter okay. is one. So a log splitter is something that we wouldn't take out there, but we would put it on our bulletin board and try to facilitate the, the movement of it to someone that was looking for it. We're also calling it the needs and leads board. Yeah. So yeah. somebody might need yeah. something, somebody might have a lead for something. Right. So. And, and some of that's driven just by the size of things. Yeah. And is the PowerPoint presentation I showed, is that going to be on the site as well? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've just, you know, I think I and many people have been trying to promote it every way possible. Yeah. So it would be nice for people to be able to see the evolution of it. Um, and one last question. Did you say what the hours are? The In hours, general? it's, it's going to be open from 8 o'clock until 11.30 on Saturdays. And then the last half hour, it's closed for us to clean up. Um, that facility is also open on Wednesday mornings. At this point, we're, we're not going to be open Wednesdays. But again, if we get an, an upswelling of volunteers, and then there's a possibility we could expand to being open that day as well. But for now, it's Saturdays from 8 to 11.30. Yeah. Okay. Council LeBarge. Yes. Can they get the reuse sticker there? Yes. It's, it's both. It's $10 for just the reuse sticker. You don't, unless you already have a transfer station sticker. Yeah. You can either get it at the DPW, where you can get a transfer station, or at the Glendale Road. Yeah, some people ask me about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? No? I, just uh, how did, you know, I think it's kind of relevant to explain how you guys got funded and subsidized, how you <coughs> sustain yourselves. Okay, well, um, last year uh, we submitted, after some months of preparation, we submitted a business plan to the Board of Public Works, and they accepted it. Uh, I think it was last May, and they agreed to let us use the space and they also funded us for ten thousand dollars which has gone into the, the renovations um, and then also the council voted last year to let us have one of those funds a small I can't remember what the term is for it uh, 
gift fund of sorts. Yeah, yeah, so that you know, that's so that we are able to accept small small donations, and we haven't done too much of that, but we will be accepting small donations out there because we have ongoing costs like publicity and utilities and all the rest of it. So. Um, those the and and uh, that's am I forgetting anything? As no, far as but I will say that we haven't spent all of our line item yet. Right, We're, right. Everybody's We're under worked budget. so hard yeah. on this and gotten donated uh, items. So I think we've only bought wood and uh, some very many stuff. What? Concrete. Yeah, and concrete. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, the reason I ask is I think it's relevant for people who might be interested in donating to the project. I mean, clearly, I've, uh, I've heard nothing but enthusiastic response about this. Even in its initial stages, when you guys first started floating this idea, way those many years back. So, uh, giving providing people an opportunity to know that they can not only donate materials, but they have an opportunity to donate money to help sustain this project. So, um, and again, I I'll, I'll call on everyone else's back here and say really thank you very much. This is. Uh, um, not only does it make sense, it's actually, it has a, it has a sexy appeal. I personally, uh, I have the, it's not an ethos, it's actually kind of an obsession. I like recycling things and reusing things or tinkering things with myself and that, that having an opportunity to have one central point that's essentially curated yeah. is a real bonus. I, and, I, and I don't suspect I'm alone with that singular obsession. But yeah. we, all, we all hate to see things thrown away that, could, that still have some use. And it's, it's tremendously exciting when we're in between two parties, one of whom is generously giving something and the other is really grateful to get it. It's just a great feeling. It's, and it's reducing our carbon footprint at the same time. So it's, uh, it's as Yankee as you get. And I yeah, think it's yeah. I mean, I've, I've been telling pe a lot of people Christmas year round. <laughs> right, right. A lot of people don't realize that our solid waste in Northampton now is getting shipped to upstate New York, almost 300 miles away. And so, this is anything we can do to cut down our carbon footprint in regards to that. I think is really good. Well, that, and that was after the closing of the landfill, the discussion about reducing our waste production. The fact that we're no longer um, controlling our own waste and its and whatever possible right. side effects it would have, it was an opportunity to at least, at the very least, reduce what we contribute to the waste stream. And I think this is this is an excellent process. So, so thank you very much again. Thank you. For thank you for it. nice nice PowerPoint. Thanks. <laughs> oh, there's David. So. Now we're back into the the meat of the meeting. Um, up next, we actually have a lot of licenses and petitions. These all come due the same time every year. Um, I suspect the inclination is going to be want to take them as uh, as a group. I would ask that you separate out at least on the first on section A. Um, feeding tube records, if you would, because okay. I have a conflict there, so okay. I'd need to recuse myself on that one. But if we could, if if you're prepared to, rest to so if you want to, I'll accept a motion to accept them um, and actually allow me to read the. Um, this is the annual secondhand dealers license renewal, and this is for the Cancer Connection of 375 South Street, uh, the Jack Spire Antiques of 416 North Main uh, Street in Leeds. Uh, Norma Menard of 25 Garfield Avenue, uh, the Family Jewels of 56 Green Street, Back Alley Antiques and Collectibles at of uh, 238 Bridge Street, Antiques Corner of 5 Market Street, Stuart Solomon at 28 North Maple Street, Ryan Jewelers 14 Strong Avenue, Feeding Two Records of 221 Pine Street, Wild Mutation Records at 52 Main Street in Florence. And the Urban Exchange of 233 Main Street. So I'll accept. So them. I'll move all of them as a group except for feeding tube records. Yes, second. I second that. There's a second. Okay. Any discussions on these petitions? And we have we have all the, the applications and licenses, and you can see that that they've been um, they're up to date on their taxes. And but any other further discussion on these? Okay. 
Um, can we do this by a voice vote, or is I think we can do this by a voice vote, yeah. by God. Yes, by yeah. voice. All right, I'll, I'll, uh, all those in favor of those petitioners being granted a license, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? Okay, now I'll accept uh, that they uh, they pass, and I'll accept the motion for uh, speaking tube records. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion on that item? Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, I'm, I'm abstaining. And any opposed? Okay. Now we can back. Can I uh, just interrupt for one second? Do you have any leftovers in those sheets? I've been instructed to reuse them. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. That would have been awkward. Okay. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have the annual junk dealer's license renewal, and this is uh, for Norman Menard of uh, 25 Garfield Avenue and Richard and Sharon Huntley of 254 East Hampton Road. And I'll accept the motion. Take as a group. Okay. And that's been moved. Is that second? second? Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion on these? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That, those licenses are approved. Next, next of course, is the... <laughs> the annual bowling license renewal. Um, we have the Northampton Bowl of 525 Pleasant Street. Um, they're down here twice. One's oh, one's and one. Yeah, thank you. And and the clerk Sunday. has notified me the one's a Sunday license and the one's the uh, the regular license. So you want take I've, as a group. Take them as a group. Uh, so I assume week. somewhere in there is a motion and a second. So. Uh, any discussion on the bowling license renewal? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes as well. Now, of course, the annual pool table license renewal, and that's for Packards at 14 Masonic Street, and they are also applying for a Sunday license. Move as a group. And both moved as a group and second. Any discussion on the pool table license renewal? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Next up, we have the annual taxi cab license renewal, and there's uh, one of the petitioners is here and actually would like to speak to us, but uh, before we do that, we should get it on the floor. But we have Cosmic Cab of 78 Con Street, and that's six taxi cab license petitions. Um, then Mercedes Cab Company uh, Incorporated doing businesses, Go Green Cab, 376 East Hampton Road. There are two taxi cab license petitions. And then we also have Mercedes Cab Incorporated doing business as Funky Cab <coughs> at 376 East Hampton Road. And that's four taxi cab license petitions. Uh, so I'll accept the motion for those as a group. Take as a group. And a second. And would you like to come speak to these? Uh, there's been a motion to recognize Don Lynch, and, and that, well, that motion's been made, and I will accept that as a second. And Don, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to read a letter that was written by our CEO, Raphael Richter, and he unfortunately was not able to attend tonight. He really wanted to be here, but he had prior obligations. He does plan <coughs> to make an appearance at a meeting soon. Um, I do have copies of the letter for everybody. Oh. Okay, we have one for the public record and yeah, thank you. Counselors, as you may have read in the newspaper recently, Mercedes Cab Company has purchased Go Green Transportation, formerly the Taxi and Green Cab. In conjunction with Funky Cab, another entity of Mercedes Cab, we're working hard to expand our service in order to provide exceptional transportation services to the community of Northampton. Mercedes Cab is a 33-year-old 33, 33 family-run business based out of Provincetown, a community very similar in some respects to Northampton, and in many ways, of course, very much not the same. 
We operate throughout Cape Cod, providing over 100,000 trips per year to residents and visitors. And we're very committed to the communities we serve, to the many drivers we contract, and to the dispatchers and mechanics that work in our operations. We intend to create and sustain many jobs in Northampton, which is demonstrated by our recent expansion and rental of garage and office space on East, excuse me, on East Hampton Road. Our services have allowed us to work with many communities on regulatory matters. After operating in and around Northampton for over two years now, we have observed and learned many things and feel that there's much room for improvement and clarification of the city's taxi and livery rules and regulations, which will then benefit your residents and visitors. A vibrant, full-service transportation company such as ours is comprised of many different types of for hire vehicles. In Massachusetts, there are several registration plate types that are used for different purposes. And it's very common for transportation companies, uh, for a transportation company to market itself as a taxi or shuttle service and have different types of vehicle registrations to be included and used for different for hire purposes. Examples of these for hire plate types and their uses include taxi plates, uh, which is defined as a private passenger motor vehicle registered as such with or without a taxi meter used or designed to be used for the conveyance of passengers for hire from place to place, but not over a fixed route or between fixed and regular termini. This type of vehicle may be requested by call to a dispatcher or hailed on a public roadway uh, for securing a ride. And it may also pick up passengers in areas that are designated for taxis, uh, meaning cab stands, basically. Livery plates uh, are defined as a private passenger motor vehicle, including but not limited to limousines. Uh, registered as such, the designed seating capacity of which does not exceed 16 people, including the driver, for hire or transport, rented by means of a telephone or smartphone request to the registered place of business of the owner, or a contract arranged in advance of the time for a designated pickup. Uh, the following we've added emphasis to because we feel like this really hits at the heart of the difference between a taxi and a livery vehicle. No licensed livery vehicle may pick up a person in response to a street hail or may stand in special areas authorized for taxi cabs, aka cab stands. In all of our service areas, we operate a combination of livery and taxi vehicles in order to best serve that community. The reason to not just have one type of registration is that taxi plates can cost about three to five times more to insure than livery plates. Uh, but they still provide the exact same level and type of liability protection. Therefore, in communities that don't have many street hail or flag fares, such as Northampton, which uh, we find to be about 95% called in fares, we operate more livery vehicles in order to provide a better service. Uh, for the community by having more for hire vehicles on the road. Additionally, we plan to make major reinvestments in our fleet by acquiring later model, later model vehicles, and it's much easier to lease or purchase newer equipment for use as livery vehicles as the cost to insure it is much lower. It's clear that the city's rules and regulations, as well as regulators, must take a closer look at the laws governing taxi and livery services in the city. And this is the primary reason for our letter today. Please consider the following. First, City Code 316-21, requiring meters to be used by all taxi companies, is being flagrantly ignored by all parties. It is our opinion that meters would be a great service to the city, as they would reduce fares slightly for shorter trips in the downtown area, while providing a more fair rate for passengers in the outlying parts of the city. However, one way or the other, we do feel that it is highly unfair to be selective about choosing which parts of the city code to enforce. Additionally, there is no provision anywhere in our laws to allow for livery vehicles to be part of a transportation company's portfolio of vehicles. And this creates a very uncomfortable situation for a company like ours trying to abide by the rules as we are told that we cannot use livery plated vehicles. 
Uh, when we've asked the city how it is that long-standing companies such as Aaron's Paradise or the Valley Transporter or any private limo company, um, how these companies uh, have been, sorry, uh, how it is that long established companies operate livery vehicles in the town legally, we are frequently told it's because they don't have offices here in Northampton. This doesn't change the fact that they're offering service in the town and should be subject to the same rules and fair competitive environment as any other business. Transportation companies operate and do business on the roadways not based on where they're physically located. Not enforcing the law equally is creating an unlevel playing field and a disadvantage for newer companies, doing a disservice to the res residents and visitors of the city as well by inhibiting competition and innovation. As you know, transportation companies that provide taxi and livery services to a community represent a public-private partnership Transportation companies should happily carry people of all socioeconomic classes and backgrounds without discrimination or bias, which represents a vital part of any city's transportation network. Our goal is to be a vibrant part of the Northampton community and provide the best transportation services that the city has ever had. But we ask that you assist all transportation companies by clarifying and updating the rules and regulations. We look forward to being a part of any working groups or forums on the topic that lead up to any potential changes. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Respectfully, Raphael Richter. And um, I would like to also add uh, that all of our managers are fully um, in support of every part of this letter. And um, I'm fully prepared to answer any and all questions that you might have as a representative of the company and of Raphael. Anyone have any questions of Dom? This time, the um, Councillor O'Donnell. Um, I just want to be clear. Uh, you're saying there's no explicit um, allowance for delivery in our city, and you construe that to mean that there's a prohibition on it. Uh, I've been told that. Yes. May I ask who told you that? Uh, the city clerk's office, basically, um, because the state requires that a vehicle for hire is licensed in the city or town in which it's operating, and the city of Northampton refuses to grant licenses to livery plated cars. Hmm? The, um, historically, the, I think it was two years ago, I might be wrong here, but uh, we had a number of um, cab companies. In fact, actually, Don has referred to them that were fun that were abusing their licensing privileges under livery standards, and the police chief was it cracked down on them. But essentially, that was like quicksilver. I think the, one of the things that Don's referring to is they just set up shop somewhere else and still operate here in the in in town. Both taxi and livery plated vehicles. Right. Uh, right. I will add. Taxi taxi tags too. Can I just ask what, uh, what did that abuse entail? What was that? Um, I think that as Don pr described it, there are limitations to what livery vehicles can do. They were functioning as cabs, um, and but using their livery tags, which and, and livery tags don't have the, the same strict criteria in some respects. And so it was just this kind of circumventing. And, and a, a, as Don points out, it is, it's cheaper to insure. Why the insurance companies make that distinction, I'm not particularly sure. But the, the fact remains is that, that you know, there were some cute cost-cutting corners uh, that were made that uh, the police chief took issue with. The thing that strikes me in this is that the requiring for metering without actual enforcement is a little frustrating. The fact that, I mean, we require child seats, and I presume that's enforced. I hope so. But if, if, if it's going to be a requirement, then it seems to me that there, there certainly should be uniformity in, in enforcement of that. Um, and I personally um, hear these. Uh, concerns and suggestions, and I think that uh, I think it's probably a good time to reconsider how we license and, and apportion licenses in, the, in in Northampton, so that we can do whatever we can to keep the people who are inclined to uh, shrug off the rules 
keep them in check and then allow and allow and improve the opportunities for people who abide by the rules. And I should say that the and I'd like to say that all the petitioners that we're currently reviewing tonight have all proven themselves uh, historically now. So, so, um, so point taken. Thank you. Wonderful. And if I may briefly also just um, mention. We had submitted, or rather I had submitted a letter in, in regards to this same topic quite a few months ago to each of you and to the chief of police, which I didn't receive any kind of response about. Um, and I just wanted to mention that because in that letter we had requested a public hearing, um, which I think that we still, uh, you know, that request still stands um, from that letter. I have a copy here if you'd like it, uh, um, an additional great. copy. Um, Did you send that snail mail or electronically? Um, okay. And actually, I shouldn't say there was no response. The chief wrote back to me and said that he would pass it along to the appropriate parties, um, which I never heard from anyone else after that. And we also wanted to okay. point out the fact that there are maximum meter rates on the books right now. Those haven't been updated in almost 20 years. And additionally, I've spoken with uh, John Frey, the uh, person. John Frey, yeah. John Frey, who does the taxi meter inspections. And he was, um, he, he, <laughs> he does not think that maximum rates uh, should be enacted. And, and he doesn't actually think that it is the city's place, of course, I'm paraphrasing him here, to put maximums um, in place. So. That letter suggests new maximum rates. Um, I would like to uh, rescind that statement and uh, go with what John had said, that we don't think maximums should be in place at all. Can I make a suggestion, Don? I think part of the problem why you, you didn't get a response mm -hmm. is put in our, our city mailboxes, and I have to say that we're not we're, we're moving into the 21st century, and we aren't paying too much attention. Gotcha. We've got a, we get a lot of spam in, yeah. our, in our boxes. If you could transmit this electronically, sure. so that it, one, it'll help it to introduce it into the public record, mm -hmm. and then we can proceed from there. Absolutely. Okay. That's wonderful. Any other questions for the petitioner? Okay. And any? Okay. Thank you, Don. All right. Thanks for your time. No, I can. I can scan this in. And yeah. No, it's good. She actually, Don, if you send an updated electronic version, rescinding your. Uh, Call for a, a, a maximum. Perfect. Okay, so she'll have an updated version. It's just sent to us. Um, okay, so the motion's been made for again for Cosmic Cab and Mercedes Cab doing businesses go green and it also has Funky Cab. Um, motion's made and seconded. All those in favor of granting the licenses, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, there's that. I'll accept a motion to uh, approve the minutes of the last meeting. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? That's from April 2nd, 2015. All those in favor? So oh, I'm sorry, I'll Council O'Donnell. Yeah. Um, I offered a correction earlier in the week to, to Pam, and I think in so doing, I might have cr uh, created That's another thing. error. So just a small, very small thing, I'll say very briefly. Uh, on page 370. <laughs> um, this is crucial information. Um, for items 15.355 uh, uh, about snow removal, there was a friendly amendment about highway business, and I believe Councillor Carney offered it, um, not Councillor uh, Klein. So I'll email you that information, but I've, if that's not clear, it sounds like it probably wasn't. But. So so yes. the bit was here. <laughs> so whatever you sent me, that's what I put in. Well, I, I may be the blame, but I'm just okay. trying to offer the correction. Yeah. So the the recommended uh, correction is to reflect that Councilor Carney was the maker of the motion, as opposed to Councilor Klein. Correct. Yes, that, uh, I do recall making that <laughs> yes. motion to uh, include. It was so long. Highway ago. business district in the. Uh, is this, is this the kind of detail that we ought to have in the minutes? Yes. Okay. Yes, it no, no, should that's show. important, actually, okay. the maker of the motion, and you should own that, yes. Great. Thank you. So all the angry letters can be rechanneled and sent. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. As amended, um, or, uh, yeah, as corrected, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
<clears throat> okay, we have no reports uh, from committees, appointments, and elections. We have, um, we do have appointments and reappointments to committees. I would say for the first for the tree commission that we take those as a group. I second. The yes. Commission. Are the motions for the tree, the newly established tree committee, public shade tree commission? And I'll read the names and butcher their names. Uh, Melon Castriata of uh, 79 West Street, Todd Ford of 78 Fern Street, Jay Gerard of 158 Ryan Road, Lily Lombard, 39 Monroe Street, Robert Postal, 44 Washington Avenue, Andrew Smith of 10 Myrtle Street, and Jennifer Werner uh, at 16 Winthrop Street. Um, so the motion's been made. Sure. Second, anyone want to speak to these? As it were. Yes, it's, it's been, we've got that point. Now we want to speak to the, about the applicants. Uh, the, they come with positive recommendations from the Committee on Rules, <coughs> Orders, Appointments, and Ordinances. So. Um, and I know that they're not, the, these guys are raring to get to work. We're already going to refer stuff to them right out of the gate. Um, and they're, they're really, and this is the season for it, so it's very appropriate that by Arbor Day that we have uh, Arbor Specialists ready on, on cue. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to have a roll call on this. So. Uh, roll call, please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Spector. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. We have a tree commission, and uh, congratulations and thank you to all those people who stepped up to do this. This is actually a rather august body, and I know uh, in discussion with the mayor, he had an embarrassment of riches uh, when it came to application. So, uh, a lot of people eager to participate in this. I'm, I'm psyched about this, and I know Councilor Carney is going to be calling them up <laughs> ASAP. She has an issue right away to deal with as well. So they'll, they'll be busy right out the, right out of the gate. Um, Next up, we have the, for the North, uh, blah, 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 Northampton Housing Authority, Jeffrey Jones, 76 Woods Road, term beginning uh, March 2015, expiring uh, June 2018. This is a reappointment. And move approval. Second it. Motions are made and seconded. Any discussion on this reappointment? Well, just to note that uh, Jeff Jones has also accepted the chair of the Housing Authority, so it's appropriate for you. Well, <laughs> Since he's the chair, we accept it. I think it seems very appropriate to vote him in, I think. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, next up is the Board of Health. We have Donald, uh, Donna Saloom of 83 Pomeroy Terrace. Uh, this is a March 15, uh, 2015 to June 2018 term for reappointment. Second. Seconds made and second. Any discussion on this appointment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Donna's in again. Uh, the Agricultural Commission reappointments we have uh, John Bobala. I, Bobala. Okay. Bobala. Damn. <laughs> I, always, I always get the wrong syllable and sort of. Okay. And Earl uh, and Parsons of 137 Mill uh, Valley Road. Uh, uh, Motions were made to move them as a group. Their terms start March 2015, which we've seen the back of, and expire June 2018. Any discussion on the uh, appointments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? Okay. And then last up on this is the Conservation Commission. We have Tricia McGovern of 53 Avis Circle in Florence term starting this month uh, and then expiring June 2018. Move to approve. Second. Motions have made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Sentence. All right. Trisha McGovern's now on the Conscon. Uh, now we come to appointments to the Northampton Housing Authority, and this is to, for referral to uh, rules, ordinance, appointments, and orders, ordinances. And this is uh, Michael Roy of 243 Park Hill Road, Alex Akers or Ackers of 32 Washington Place, um, and Jim Rice of 108 uh, Coles Meadow Road. And these are terms starting this month and expiring June 2018. Motions are made to refer and seconded. 
Any discussion on the referral? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Wow. That's that's about 220 pages of the uh, agenda so far we just chewed through. I don't know if anyone's seen the actual paper document of this meeting tonight. It's 275 pages, so that's... Um, the, we have meeting minutes for uh, the Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, Ordinances. Uh, this is the minutes of March 9th, 2015. We also have Finance Committee meeting minutes of January 15, 2015, and February uh, 5th, 2015, March 5th, 2015, and Public Safety minutes of March 2nd, 2015, and the Public Works Committee of the City Council minutes, uh, uh, meeting <laughs> minutes of February 23, 2015. Suggest we take it as a group unless there's a Motion's been made and seconded uh, to move them as a group. Any discussion on these minutes? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Now we come to the Finance Committee, and I cede the gavel to uh, Councillor Adams, who will be presiding over finance as we go into recess. Call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Councillor Adams? Here. Councillor Lavard? Present. Councillor Sheriff? Here. Is there a motion to approve the, minute, minute, uh, the minutes of the previous meeting? <coughs> Second. <coughs> Is there any discussion on this matter? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. We'll move to agenda item number four, which are which is financial order, uh, fifteen point three ninety six water and sewer sewer rates for FY twenty sixteen revised. Upon the recommendation of the mayor, it is ordered that. Oh, the following water and sewer rates be in effect for fiscal year twenty sixteen, July first, twenty fifteen, to June thirtieth, twenty sixteen. Water, $5.58 per cubic per 100 cubic feet, and sewer, $6.08 per 100 cubic feet. Mr. Mayor, would you like to speak to these? Uh, certainly. And um, I did provide you initially with a memo um, based on my original recommendation to you um, uh, that I submitted to the council originally. Um, and there's a, there was a memo uh, that actually from Mr. Huntley uh, to me on March 30th. Um, and then obviously I submitted a revised memo on April 10th, uh, 2015. Um, so effectively this, um, this revised recommendation would hold the rates uh, where they are uh, currently uh, for another year. Um, as we talked about in the memo, uh, we do uh, anticipate that we have a number of uh, critical investments that we need to make over the next several years. Um, the department is in the process of finalizing um, the uh, the significant asset management plans that they've been working on and actually that, that the city council and mayor have supported the funding for uh, beginning in 2009. Um, and so the, the, the hope would be that uh, we'd be able to get those um, asset management plans finalized we have an opportunity to really present them to the public so the public could understand um, the issues that we will need to deal with, particularly um, significantly at the uh, wastewater treatment plant on Hockenham Road, um, which, uh, as the memo points out, was you know, built in the 70s. There have been some uh, upgrades done to it, but it, it does require some significant upgrades that we'll need to be able to um, uh, schedule and begin uh, planning our debt schedules for. Um, there's also a number of uh, water-related <laughs> projects, um, including one, uh, uh, a dam, some dam projects that need, uh, need work um, a few years off into the future as well. So I do not make this recommendation to freeze the rates lightly, as I said in my memo, but at the same token, as I pointed out in the, in the memo, um, you know, this is the first time that uh, we're operating under this new system of the city council and the mayor setting the rates. Um, I think based on the general laws since 1921, um, uh, that, uh, that, that, that the, um, the other system went into effect. And I do feel like um, when we put together the budget calendar for this year, um, which was you know, November, December, um, we had sort of had, we'd sort of had a placeholder for this 
uh, rate setting, but I, I, I don't think we really allowed enough time for it. I don't think it kind of uh, truncated the process. It kind of put the council in a position of having to do it sort of in a one month period or less. Um, I have to submit the budget um, by May 15th to you. The rates dictate the budget. Um, and I did hear a lot of excellent questions and a lot of excellent concerns at the hearing that the Committee on Public Works held. And, and then, frankly, <coughs> they're some of the same questions that I've had um, and want to have an opportunity to explore, um, including looking at the possibility of tiered rates um, and looking at the possibility of providing some need-based discounts uh, to people like we do with property tax um, and some of, and like we've done, like this council did with the new stormwater utility. The difficulty is um, uh, it will be impossible to try to enact those by um, when I need to submit the budget to you on May 15th. So, um, and in fact, we've already begun some discussions about um, working on, uh, on um, bringing in some folks who are experts at analyzing municipal water and sewer rates and, uh, and, and coming up with scenarios for different tiering. When I say tiering, um, some communities adopt a system whereby uh, the first several units of water that a person consumes, you pay one rate for that water. Um, then you move up into a higher tier of water consumption and you pay a different rate uh, you know, above that first tier. And then once you get into a third tier, you're paying a different rate. So um, I guess the analogy I would use would be to, ta to our tax system, the current system we have is kind of a flat tax, meaning that if you're a mega user or you're a, a small user, you're paying the same rate, but obviously, um, you know, your ability to pay, there's a lot of other factors that go into it. The, you know, by, by tiering it, I think it also builds in a ethic around water conservation because uh, folks that are using less water will pay less. Um, and so it sort of incentivizes water conservation, which is what we want. So, so I think those are, these are all the possibilities that I want to be able to look at, bring forward. Um, but we don't have the time to do that. And I really feel like I want to also, um, as we incorporate this, these two budgets, the enterprise fund budgets for water and sewer, into our overall budget structure, and now that I'm more directly overseeing these two um, enterprises and working more closely with the DPW, there's a lot more work that we want to do around um, how we present the information, um, how we align it with the rest of the budget. So what will be the impact? I know that's the, that's the um, $64,000 question of not, um, of not enacting the rather modest uh, increases that I had initially proposed. The, um, on the water side, uh, and I, I, I spoke about the proposed budget um, being approximately $6.8 million for the water enterprise budget under the, under the original proposal. Um, by freezing the rates for a year, it will generate $186,000 less in revenue um, than had we increased it. Um, uh, and so what essentially that will require us to do, if you look at the memo that we produced for you originally, uh, it means that um, some of the, well, Primarily, one of the water design projects we would put off a year. That's the old Ferry Road project. Um, and of the design projects, that is, um, you know, that's a project that we wanted to get into the design process, um, but it's tied with a larger uh, stormwater project uh, dealing with uh, Ward 3 in the Connecticut River that's on a much probably longer time frame. So, um, so that's one that I think if it does get delayed, I don't think it's going to have a critical impact because that's going to be a longer term project. It will also reduce the amount of, um, it will also reduce um, uh, funding that would be put into a stabilization fund, about $30,000 that would go into a stabilization fund for future projects. Um, and it would also require some minor reductions in, in O&M line items um, to be able to, uh, to, to not have that rate increase versus what I originally proposed. On the sewer side, um, as I described at the, uh, at the committee meeting, the proposed budget there uh, was about $6.2 million for sewer. Um, the reduction um, in revenue that would result from freezing the rates uh, is $182,000. Um, 
And uh, for the counselors that were <laughs> at that hearing, um, we showed basically a pie chart of what the sewer budget consisted of, and largely it consisted of O&M. Uh, then there was about five to six hundred thousand dollars that was devoted to ongoing debt service, and then there was a separate uh, pot, uh, slice of the pie, uh, which was about one point three million dollars that would go into stabilization toward future projects. So what we would essentially do is reduce that one point three million dollar allocation by one hundred and eighty-two thousand. Um, again, keeping in mind that that one point three million is designed to be built up over time to be able to handle the debt service of these future projects that we uh, lay out in the, um, that's laid out for you in that original memo, um, which includes some fairly significant projects uh, related to the, significantly to the wastewater treatment plant, as well as some of the dam projects, uh, which, you know, the, the Ryan and West Whateley Reservoir project, which is on the order of $6 million. Um, and these are projects that are projected out in the 2019, 2020, 2021 timeframe. So my hope is that we will um, have an opportunity to, t to spend the next uh, 12 months really, uh, well, first of all, the, the other piece that I mentioned, the presentation uh, to both the public and to the council of these new capital asset plans and some of the needs so that people can really understand the needs and then at the same time have the opportunity to really work on um, other possible rate scenarios um, so that we can bring forward something um, that, uh, that might provide or might answer some of the questions or address some of the issues that, um, that I heard about at the uh, Committee on Public Works hearing. That's, that's large. Council of Barge. Mayor, I know at the meeting we have talked about we have many people who are over that threshold of getting exempt in the city. And you did state and told me directly that you would possibly meet with Joan Serafin in regards of looking at the state regulations of how their formula is to see if you could do amendments are you still thinking of doing I'm, that i'm um you know as i mentioned at the meeting um i'm very mindful of uh of how all of our uh rates whether they be taxes or um utilities um impact uh, folks who were on a fixed income um and so we are going to be examining those and examining um, not only what we have set up locally, but some of the state formulas that, uh, that dictate, particularly right now on the property ta tax side, um, but it's also the same formulas that we apply to stormwater and to some of the other programs. But, um, but we will definitely be, that will be definitely a part of it to find out uh, what we can do um, to address that issue because one of the common issues we've heard is that the, um, the basically the counselor is referring to the income limit limits that we set. Um, and uh, some of them are driven by state um, formulas uh, that we must abide by. Some of them are actually driven by social security um, numbers that we get from the federal government. And so we are going to be looking at those and figuring out if, the, if there's ways that we can update those um, because that is a common Concern we've heard is that um, you know you set the cutoff at a certain point, and um, some people meet it, but then there may be other people who have a need but don't meet it. So we're going to have to figure out how we can um, how we can look at those numbers. Right, and I'm hearing that also from many veterans, and we had a couple of veterans at that meeting, but they don't get exempt for anything. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I mentioned at the hearing that you know we did, um, you know. My administration did try, did implement the, the tax work off program for veterans and for seniors, and that's providing some opportunities for, for tax relief for veterans. Um, veterans are eligible for some uh, benefits, obviously, um, you know, through some of the uh, Chapter 115 and other programs, um, and there are some um, exemptions specifically for disabled veterans, um, but, uh, but that would be something we would take a look at. Um, as I've said before, I, 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 um, I, I real for me it really is about um, having things be need based and having things be um, based on what people's you know needs are, and that we take a look at people's income levels and we take a look at what um, what is reasonable for for folks who are on a fixed income who are trying to 
remain in their homes in Northampton. So we do want to look at ways that we can try to um, make sure that we're not pricing people out. Um, at the same time, and I give credit to many of the folks who were there, you know, folks acknowledge the fact that we do need to take care of these systems. I mean, we heard from somebody who came to that hearing who was very much opposed to the rates, but then she also heard that we were going to upgrade the water system on North Farms Road, which, um, you know, has very bad water pressure and, and, uh, and including for fire uh, suppression. And she understood why that really needed to be done. So it's a balancing act. I think people understand intuitively, um, particularly if it's the water on their street or the sewer on their street, that that costs money and we have to be able to invest in that. And obviously, things like the wastewater treatment plant, where we're dealing with um, you know highly regulated activities um, by the DEP and the EPA, and we have to get that right because we're, otherwise we'll be putting sewage into the Connecticut River and we'll be subject to, to penalties and fines. Um, you know, these are public safety issues, clean drinking water, um, uh, proper sewage disposal. Um, so we're, for me, the main thing is, and, I, and this is what I've tried to apply to all the work that I've done, um, particularly as it relates to the budget, um, is really educating people and putting the information out there so that they can understand it. And I think um, when, when we've done that, I think people have responded to that, and I think people in Northampton have responded to that. So that's kind of what I want to make sure we do for the whole water and sewer rate process. And, uh, and unfortunately, I felt like we were so pressed for time that we really weren't able to do that um, justice. So I think that would be an excellent idea to go into that direction, Mayor. I also wanted to let you know I did have a couple of residents who asked me to present a couple of questions tonight to you. Okay. What will be the repercussion of not raising water and sewer rates this year? Could you answer that? I, well, I, um, I did actually just detail that for folks. So I, I mentioned the fact that we would be, um, it would be 186, 299 less of revenue in the water enterprise fund, which would affect, um, uh, would affect uh, at least one uh, design project it would also uh, result in some reductions in, um, in what was being allocated to stabilization as well as some cuts in, um, in the O&M line item. Uh, on the sewer side, I mentioned that the uh, freezing the rates would result in $182,678,000 less in revenue um, and that that would be primarily um, taken from what had been pro projected to go into the stabilization fund for um, for the uh, sewer enterprise fund. I just so, want to make sure that they're hearing. So that's those are um, those are impacts. I mean, you also have to understand that the rates um, also um, have a, you know, they they build upon each other from year to year. So um, so that's you know one hundred eighty two thousand dollars in revenue this year, but then next year it has an impact. So it does have a longer term impact. Um, so you know, it's I I I want to emphasize that. Um, we, I, I fully suspect that I will be bringing forward in a year a proposal that, um, that will require additional investments. What I'm hoping is that if we can structure the rate, um, if we can come up with some tiering potential, if we can come up with some other programs, particularly aimed at people who are um, you know, in that category we discussed on a, on a fixed income and, and have limited resources, then I think that may be um, a, a, a way that we can present it that people will uh, that will that will be more acceptable to people. And another question was, what steps or actions can or will be taken to mitigate to offset it? Um, I think you know uh, if I if I understand your correction, I, I uh, your question I think will obviously be working to make sure that um, we're not that these. Um, well, I don't want to call them cuts. It's sort of like revenue that we're not raising. We're not, mm -hmm. uh, we're not actually proposing to lay anyone off or to cut any staff or anything like that. Um, obviously, the resources we do have, uh, the, the DPW and the folks in the water and sewer departments are obviously going to focus on the most critical projects and, and obviously work on the most critical projects. Um, and, uh, and I think as I've described, the, um, the impacts, uh, the, uh, the projects that are being pushed off um, 
are not uh, are not deemed critical right now, but obviously some of these projects in the future are critical, and so we have to really get about um, planning to do them. Also, I have a group on my ward right now that are bringing up about the pilot program and about you as a mayor, because as city councilors, we cannot negotiate with like Smith College and so forth like that, but to work with them to see if there is a way possible that we could have Smith College come in and help the city out financially. Counselor. And you know, uh, I'm talking about because there are shortfalls that apparently might occur in the next two years in our school systems, we're hearing this. I think if we can make an agreement with them, it would be a good thing to do to work with Smith College or even some of the private entities Councilor to help defray. Okay, if I could, sir, can you explain how this is relevant to the water and sewer rates, please? Yeah, but this is what it is. They're talking, Councilor Adams, people on my word about the mayor looking at Smith College to go into a pilot program to help defray the cost of what's happening here. So that's it. Um, okay, I, and I've, I've heard from folks about that, and I and um, and definitely uh, payment in lieu of taxes is something that I'm engaged in, and um, and I'll be saying a little bit more about that soon. Um, but I appreciate you uh, reiterating those comments. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Glenn. I, I hope that in the calculus as you're trying to figure out the tier system that you. We take into account that, unfortunately, fees in and of themselves tend to be somewhat regressive, um, and particularly when it's water consumption, because people of means actually can afford lower flow systems and also addressing leaks, which I know the net has always described that that, I mean, leaks are probably the biggest uh, culprit, and um, people can afford to have those fixed. So consequently, you can have someone in a much larger home that's more up to date, that is consuming and using less water and discharging more in the sewers exactly. than someone who's on a fixed income who doesn't have the ability to to augment those and it, that becomes it, it gets really tricky and it's it's unfortunately this is as i've often described this is a situation that's usually handed to us as we abdicate um essentially well in some cases collecting taxes from corporations and and uh, wealthier people we defer to um establishing fee structures and uh, and then relying on property taxes knowing that this this is the limits of your abilities here but if there is some tier system that the state smiles upon that allows us to accommodate those uh, who might not be able to um, readily address uh, uh, their their consumption beyond <coughs> reducing use which I think you heard during the testimony and I got a lot of letters to that effect that a lot of people have been been very assiduous about that and trying to really limit their use and reusing water and gray water and the like yet still at the same time feeling the burden the the other thing that I wanted to say was and so that wasn't so much a question it was just a suggestion and also that um, I, I think what I wasn't able to attend, but what you witnessed at that meeting was a lot of pent-up energy that had been sort of stored up since 1921 in some cases uh, of, 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 about the pressures, uh, you know, about the inability to actually respond to concerns about raising taxes and fees and the like. And we experienced this winter a number of people in fixed incomes who also got an electric bill that was 35 point some odd percent bump. Uh, from the previous rate, and the frustration there for folks, which is that is a, a is really onerous. But the frustration for that is there's no outlet in which to, and there's no line or no group of people that they can address that those concerns and outrage for those increases beyond just sort of railing at your electric meter, which is really not very effective. But the fact is is that now that the mayor and the council set the rates. There is an opportunity for the public to come and speak to those points, and they certainly did. But that's precisely what we were inviting, and that we wanted to do. And um, and I applaud your decision in this case, not to rush. In this respect, I mean, I think you're right. Circumstances have set it up so that 
really didn't have enough time for a uh, clear vetting and and possible accommodations of some of these pressures but it's I, I want the public to understand that this with this new order with having the council and the mayor being in charge there is the opportunity to make your case and recognize that you are heard and that there has been a reaction and a response you're not going to get a response from the electric company they, they have not responded other than they've reduced their rates or the natural gas company and the oil companies are not going to uh, hold things back just because you've expressed concerns so I I'm I'm very grateful for what uh, uh, your 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 diligence on this and your thoughtfulness in this process so thank you and just one other thing sort of popped into my head as you were describing uh, as you were making that point um, and it sort of goes back to what uh, Councillor um, LaBarge had said I mean one of the one of the reasons why we have water and sewer rates versus paying for it on the tax rate is so that nonprofits um, right. pay water and sewer, which which our largest nonprofits do pay water and sewer. They're not exempt from from those kinds of. So, I mean, that other matter you were discussing in terms of how it affects these issues. I mean, the, the nonprofits are paying water and sewer. They are paying storm water. So, right. um, and obviously, some people who pay taxes. Um, are not also water and sewer users like many of your residents who are on septic or have wells um, they're not part so it's it's in some ways mostly the same people but there's an actually good policy reason for why we have an enterprise fund and for why we use fees um, so that we're not uh, dependent on subsidizing it through the uh, property tax so um, so anyway that yeah I'm I'm, I, um, I'm mindful of the issues you raise and we will um, we'll be thinking about those over the next several months as we study uh, different approaches to the rates. Mr. O'Donnell. Um, there's, of course, a, a split possible uh, in property taxes uh, between commercial and residential, which Northampton, does, we don't make a distinction there. Um, to your knowledge, is that an option that any city or town uses in terms of There the are actually or? all, there pretty much there are lots of possibilities. There are many possibilities. Um, and um, and so uh, and some people do use utilize things like that. Um, the uh, obviously the tiering kind of gets to that because it gets to the largest consumers of water um, in a different way. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's there's all kinds of possibilities. It's just in the short time that I've had a chance to kind of study it, um, and that's one of the reasons why I want to really um, work with some folks who have a who have an expertise at looking at your particular system. I mean, our system may not may be different from a system where you have a community with, you know, 50% of the users are all large, high-end commercial users um, versus in our case where we may have, you know, I think we have one user who's like 30% of the user. Um, and uh, and so um, so we have to, we have to kind of customize it, but we'll be looking at all those options definitely. Yeah, just definitely. when I when I look at my street, it's some of my neighbors. Um, some of my neighbors are humans, and <laughs> some of them are Coca Cola. You know, yes. in my section of Ward Three, and certainly yes, indeed. A difference. Corporations so. are people. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we won't debate that. Uh, um, so yes, yeah, so oh, that's the, so there's a lot of possibilities. It's it's less restricted than it is in terms of uh, property tax rates. So we have the ability to be a little more creative. Okay. Um, so. Is there any further discussion? And I do have, obviously, Mr. Huntley is here as well. And so um, if you have specific questions for him or anything, he's also here to provide um, backup if you have any other questions. Obviously, his memo kind of goes into good detail, four pages of, of all the projects that they'll be working on over the next several years um, and obviously we'll be hearing more from the department soon about their asset management plans Ned, may I ask you about the sewage treatment plan um, that, that went online 1979 actually the first <clears throat> the first plant was built in 1956 I think it was it basically sludge drying beds back then and they went to a uh, more primary process in 1979 um, then they went to a secondary process in 1996. So it's been a number of years since we've done a lot of work down there. The other thing that's happened over the years is that when the plant was built in 79, there was a lot of federal money available for building plants and cleaning up the rivers in the whole nation. 
Uh, that money's not available anymore. As outlined in my memo, we believe we'll be qualifying for state revolving funds at 2%, which is a pretty good bonding rate for that, uh, rather than typically you know, between 25 to 35 to maybe up to 4%. So we think that will help us on that end of, as far as the wastewater treatment plant goes. So, so those funds are available because we will have an approved comprehensive wastewater management stand, uh, plan by the state. I mean, also well, so 1979, it's back uh, roughly around the same time. We were under the socialist regime of Ronald Reagan, as I recall, so that, that when we were actually subsidized projects like this for clean rivers and, and the federal government used to provide for levees and dikes and all the other systems, and that's just me being snarky. The, um, the, the Now, when we, we basically, we were able to defer for quite a while building a water filtration system and then the EPA standards uh, mandated that we actually had to build something which is currently the sum of the debt we're paying down up in Williamsburg. It, you foresee, it seems that you guys are building capacity in anticipation of something similar happening with the sewage treatment plant. Am I reading that right? We have, we have identified in the next five to probably seven years that there's about $30 million worth of work to be done on the sewer system. Not just the wastewater treatment plant, but pump stations and so on. Um, you know, we're we're looking at that and, and how we move that forward. When the water treatment plant was first designed in 1995, <clears throat> it was estimated to cost 12 million dollars to build. We received a well, waiver from filtration for a number of years, and finally we had a consent order from the federal government to build it. And um, it turned out to be about a 28 million dollar facility when we built it in 2008. So even though we saved money, it cost a lot more. You know, 10 years down the road, 12 years down the road. That yeah, that was the nature of my question. That's what I was trying to get at. So, I, and and I think it is important that we we stress that these these things are uh, when people say why do these rates continue to go up or why do these circumstances go up? It's also in anticipation of these investments that we're going that we are going to be mandated and that we actually are morally bound to to accommodate. Right. And as you recall, in 2002, 2003, the water <coughs> rates went up 22 percent that year. Yeah. Anticipation of borrowing for the water treatment right. plant. Thank you. You're welcome. Further discussion. <coughs> All those, or is there a motion to send the water and sewer rates forward with a positive recommendation of the full council? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Next, we move to the financial order for the Academy of Music Thank you. Fire Escape Repair Project. Upon the recommendation of the mayor, ordered that $12,000 be appropriated in the FY15 general fund undesignated fund balance to fund unanticipated costs relating to subsurface drainage, gutters, and pavement for the Academy of Music Fire Escape Repair Project. Hi, counselors. Um, I I think I came before you once before to get yeah. some additional money for this project. I thought that was going to be the last time. Um, but we, um, we uh, once again ran into some final uh, snags in the project. Um, some of you who may have been driving recently on New South Street may have seen the, um, the, the area where the new fire escapes are. And you can sort of see that it's all kind of torn up and there's dirt there. And actually, the the poured concrete piers that were you know, poured into the sauna tube are still like above grade. Um, what happened was when they went to do that installation, uh, there was an underground, the gutter system basically had gone into the ground there. Um, and it basically had compromised the soil so badly that when they went to try to pour footings for the, um, for the fire escape, they ended up having to do a much more um, in-depth um, excavation, um, and they had to figure out a way to reroute the um, where the terminus of the downspouts were for the Academy of Music. So the funds that you're approving will help us uh, pay for this sort of reworking of the gutter system and the uh, where the where the water will actually terminate. Um, it also uh, pay is paying for. Uh, the um, sort of finishing the grade of that whole area that's now kind of a, a, a dirt um, patch um, so that we can get it fixed and get it paved properly and get those sauna tubes under, under grade so that they're not uh, a trip hazard for people. And it will finally kind of finish off the project uh, once and for all. So um, that's the purpose of the funds. 
Are there any questions for the mayor? Councilor Speck. I see you're requesting two readings. Could you just explain why? Well, we'd like to be able to um, uh, get the work completed. Okay. Uh, we have a number of um, shows uh, coming up, and, uh, and people use that side door area quite a bit. And so we're just concerned about um, people, especially as they come around the building. It's kind of an uneven area. Okay. Um, and also, if we start to get significant rainfall, um, we're concerned about you know sort of erosion of that area because okay. right now it's kind of still soil and dirt and it's kind of all exposed. So we and you know and frankly, you know it's an eyesore. Uh, and the academy we've put so much money into the academy. Uh, not we, but you know, in terms of donations, in terms of state money, um, and there's been a lot of work to really, uh, you know, make it the gem that it is. That, you know, it's sort of ugly. It's sort of an eyesore to see this last piece of it not finished. So we just want to get it finished. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Questions? Is there a motion to send us forward with a positive recommendation of the full council? Moved and seconded. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Is there any new business in finance? Motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you, Councilor Adams. We now move out of recess and go back into the regular meeting. Um, and we will take the items that you were just, just reviewed in, in finance, uh, starting with the water and sewer rates for FY 2016 revised. And this will be a first reading. I'll set the motion for number four, please. So, so motion. I'll take one of those as a second. <laughs> so, okay. Um, any further discussion or any comments on this? Roll call, please. Councilor Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sherra. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Kearney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. That passes in first reading now. Originally, we were talking about scheduling a meeting for April 30th um, in discussion with the mayor that uh, you feel that that's not necessary at this point that we can go. Well, my concern. Um, at the time was that I have to submit a budget to you by May 15th and we need to know what the rates will be. Um, so uh, I can proceed um, based on tonight's vote. Uh, obviously your next meeting is May 7th, which would only be uh, okay. you know eight days prior to when the budget's due. So um, I can go on a first reading and build the budget from there. Um, uh, you know, I was, I initially, I wanted to do it on April 30th just so that we could have both readings done in the right. month of April, and then we'd have at least 15 days to, to finalize the budget. So um, I, I'm, I'll, I'm open to whatever the council wishes to do. Council I think given the nature of the vote and that it was unanimous, I think you could pretty well rest assured okay. that we, we don't need that meeting and you can build your budget um, based on that vote. I mean. Okay. We could have a huge earthquake or something could happen and water. But okay. I would, I would encourage you. Water again. Uh, uh, Council of Barge, Council of Connor. Okay. Oh, just a question. I mean, not an earthquake, but a quorum issue. If there's, I know I may not be here on the 7th, and uh, if, if we do need a two thirds, uh, we need six votes in order to pass the financial order. Is there, is there a question about that? Well, um, that's a good point. Um, I don't. I have heard from any other counselors suggesting that they might not be here. Should it come to that, I will contact and we can do a remote participation. Okay. We or we could call a special meeting a few after. days after. <laughs> we, did, we didn't get to do a remote participation. Yeah. We're just aching to do that. So should it come to that, we can we can certainly okay. invoke that. Pretty. Although remote participation wouldn't help your quorum issue if you had a quorum yeah. issue. Well, the, the or, quorum, yeah. or, or counselor, we could call, if we don't have a quorum that Thursday, we could call another meeting early the next week, a special meeting. I just don't see the necessity right now. I don't think, unless other counselors here now or as long as I can not send the council well, that this is fine. Are other counselors not going to be here or know they're not going to be here on that May 7th meeting? Well, I can't guarantee it. The only other option would be to do two Should readings, but that's I, your. That's well, your the reason I'm tonight. I, I, would, I would actually, uh, I don't see a problem with doing two readings for a number of reasons, especially at the rate. It's not as though there's an increase that we're talking about. We're talking about a freeze. Um, it seems that 
it might not be inappropriate to do two readings tonight, mm -hmm. given that it's not a substantial change. In fact, it's no change. Uh, um, so you as a motion? Yes, I'd make a motion that we amend uh, council rules to do two readings tonight. All right. So there's a motion to suspend rules mm -hmm. for the second reading and seconded. Um, and as to the discussion part, the only thing that makes me slightly anxious is we're missing a member tonight who might be opposed, who might invoke minority reconsideration, um, say. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. so there's there's that. I'm not going to presume anything on Councilor Murphy's vote on this issue, although I have not heard from him one way or another on this, so I don't know. That's my only concern, but that, that's also the nature of missing meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I think what Councilor Carney proposes um, makes a lot of sense um, to one part of me, and the other part of me thinks it's the first time we're voting to um, voting on these rates at all. So. Um, and I actually think there's kind of a slim chance that we won't have the required counselors um, at a meeting. And so I, I respect the position. I think I feel differently, but whatever the council decides. Uh, any further discussion on the motion to suspend rules? Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Any abstentions? Okay, passes. We're, I'll take accept the motion on second I'll move second reading. reading. Motions are made in second on second reading. Any further discussion on setting the sewer and water rates? Roll call, please. This is a uh, second reading of the water and sewer rates. Okay, uh, Labarge. Yes. yes. Councilor Rodon. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Fine. Yes. That passes in second reading. And the rates for water and sewer are set for 2016. Next up is the financial order for the Academy of Music Fire Escape Repair Project. And as you heard, there was a request for two readings. Is there mm -hmm. accept the motion? There's a motion made. Is there seconded? Second. Okay. Um, any further discussion on this item? This is like pulling a loose thread on a sweater, this project. But um, uh, no further discussion. Roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Yes. Councilor Lovard. Yes. Move to suspend rules for uh, two readings. Motions are made Second. and seconded to suspend rules. <laughs> Any discussion on the suspension of rules? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I'll accept the motion. Move second reading. Second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call on second reading for the uh, fire escape funds. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. That passes in second reading. Those approved. Um, you'll notice item C on your agenda we've already done. So we knock that off. We're up to uh, the financial order. This is <clears throat> second reading for the appropriation of $20,500 from the Cemetery Perpetual Care Fund to fund a conservation plan for the Bridge Street Cemetery. Move second reading. Second. Motions are made in second. Any further discussion on this? This is, as you recall, is to uh, improve the fence and do and affect some repairs in over and above the CPC um, funding for this project. The fence. No offense or no fence. <laughs> this isn't this isn't the fence project. This is the yeah, this is uh, the planning process. The planning process. Yeah. My bad. Okay. Yeah. I'm no no offense. Me, I'm sure, but no, no offense <laughs> taken. So it's okay. So <laughs> yeah, Fred no defense. Uh, any further discussion? It's an inside board three. <laughs> Fred killed the fence. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Spector. Yes. 
Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Scherer. Yes. And now we come to the ordinance pertaining to the ban of single use plastic bags. Um, and I will uh, ah, read the order, but now it's sideways. <laughs> Do you have a copy of That's no, actually been deleted yet. We, oh, yeah. Um, Do you have a copy? Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Adams happens to have a copy. This is uh, <clears throat> an ordinance of the city of Northampton. Uh, the, actually doesn't have the sponsors listed here. Oh, there they are. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of Councilor Jesse M. Adams and Councilor Paul D. Spector uh, and the Youth Camp, uh, the Northampton Youth Commission. And be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and the City Council assembled as follows. Section 1. The Section two, uh, Chapter 278-18 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended so that such section shall read as follows. Environmental protection and solid waste reduction be ordained as follows. Section 1, general definitions, 1.1, compostable packaging shall mean packing that is made of materials that conforms to the current American Society for Testing of Materials International, D6400 for uh, compostability. 1.2, biodegradable packaging shall mean packaging other than plastic or styrofoam which composts into beneficial breakdown components. 1.3, recyclable, uh, mater recyclable material that can be sorted, cleansed, and reconstituted um, using available recycling collection programs for the purpose of using al the altered form in the manufacture of a new product. Recycling does not include burning, incinerating, converting, or otherwise thermally destroying solid waste. 1.4, retail establishment shall mean all sales outlets, stores, shops, pharmacies, or other places of businesses, a you know, business located within the city of Northampton which sell or convey merchandise directly to the ultimate customer. 1.5, uh, retail food establishment shall mean all sales, <coughs> excuse me, all sales outlets, stores, shops, restaurants, markets, supermarkets, clubs, or other places of business which sell, serve, or convey food directly to the ultimate consumer. And this definition shall include, but is not limited to any place where food is prepared, mixed, cooked, baked, smoked, preserved, bottled, packaged, handled, stored, manufactured, sold, or offered to the public, uh, similar places in which food or drink is prepared for sale or service on the premises or elsewhere, and any other establishment or operation, including in-home caterers, where food is processed, prepared, stored, served, or provided for the public, regardless of what there is a charge for the food. 1.6, retail service establishments shall mean all places of business located within the city of Northampton where a service specialized or professional uh, work is offered to the public regardless of whether there is a charge for the service. And 1.7, merchandise shall mean products that are purchased in the retail stores. An ASTM shall mean a standard developed by the American Society for Testing and Materials. Section 2, shopping bag definitions, and these are actually probably more relevant. This is the thin film single-use plastic bags are bags with a thickness of 3.0 mils or less and are intended for single-use transport of purchased products. 2.2, biodegradable bags are bags that one, contain no polymers derived from fossil fuels and two, is intended for single use and will decompose in a natural setting to environmentally beneficial material at a rate comparable to other biodegradable materials such as paper, leaves, and food waste. And 2.3, reusable bags are bags that have a thickness greater than 3.0 mils and is specifically designed for multiple use and is made of thick recyclable plastic, cloth, fabric, or other durable materials that do not decompose into harmful chemical components. A reusable bag may I believe be recyclable or compostable and is specifically designed and manufactured for multiple <laughs> use, reuse. 2.4, compostable plastic bags are plastic bags that one, conform to the current American Society for Testing and Materials International uh, for compostability. Two, is certified and labeled as meeting the ASTM D6400 standard specification by a recognized verification entity. <clears throat> and three, 
conforms to any other standards deemed accept acceptable by this section. Section 3, general prohibition and regulation. 3.1, no retail establishment, retail food establishment, or retail service establishment as defined in sections 1.4, 1.5 and 1.6 respectively shall sell or convey merchandise to ultimate customers in thin film single use plastic bags and shall only use such bags that are one reusable or two biodegradable bags or three compostable plastic bags. Section four, these are the exemptions. Section three of this regulation shall not apply to the following items. 4.1, thin film plastic bags used to contain dry cleaning, newspapers, produce, meat, bulk foods, wet items, and other similar merchandise, typically without handles. 4.2, any flexible, transparent covering for uncooked or raw meat, poultry, raw fish, hard cheese, cold cuts, fruit, and vegetable products, baked goods, or bread. And then we come up to Section 5, the penalties enforcement. <clears throat> 5.1. If it is determined that a violation of any section of this ordinance has occurred, the health department or the mayor's designee shall issue a warning notice for the initial violation. 5.2. If an additional violation of this ordinance has occurred within one year after a warning notice has been issued for the initial violation, the health department or the mayor's designee shall issue a notice of violation and shall impose a penalty against the retail establishment. 5.3. The penalty for each violation that occurs after the issuance of the warning notice shall be no more than one, fifty dollars for the first offense, two, one hundred dollars for the second offense, and all subsequent offenses. Payment shall be made within 21 days to the city clerk. Non-payment of such fines may be enforced through civil action in the Northampton District Court, and no more than one penalty shall be imposed upon a retail establishment within a seven calendar day period. Uh, 5.4, violators shall have 21 calendar days after the date that a notice of the violation is issued to pay the penalty. Section 6, date of effect. This ordinance will take effect on January 1st, 2016. Section 7, hardship deferments. Upon a written application, the health department or the mayor's designee after a public hearing may defer application of any section of this ordinance for a six-month period after the effective date stated in Section 6 of this ordinance upon a showing of hardship. Hardship will be found when, one, compliance with any section of this ordinance would cause significant economic difficulty. Two, there is no readily available compliant uh, substitute. 7.2. Any entity granted a deferment by the health department or the mayor's designee must reapply prior to the end of the six-month exemption uh, period and demonstrate continued undue hardship if it wishes to have a deferment extended. Deferments may only be granted for intervals not to exceed six months. 7.3. A deferment granted in accordance with this section may be extended no more than two additional six-month periods upon written application to the health department or the mayor's designee at least two months prior to the expiration of the prior deferment period and upon showing that the circumstances justifying the deferment continue to exist. 7.4, a deferment application shall include all information necessary, health department for, necessary for the health department to make its decision, including but not limited to documentation showing the factual support for the claim deferment. The health department or the mayor's designee may require the applicant to provide additional information to permit uh, it to determine the facts regarding the deferment application. 7.5, the health department or the mayor's designee may approve the deferment application in whole or in part with or without conditions that deems necessary to protect the environment and public health and further the interests of, of this ordinance. 7.6, deferment decisions are, effectively, are effective immediately and final. Section 8, severability and ordinance numbering. Uh, any word, term, or section deemed illegal for any reason may be severed from this ordinance without affecting the viability of the whole. The remaining sections in Article 2, Integrated Solid Waste Management, shall be re renumbered to 272-19 through 272-23. I'll accept a motion. So Motion's been made yeah. and seconded. Councilor Spector. Um, I want to thank that in English. Yeah, I'm going to put that in English. I want to thank Councilor Adams, who's a lawyer. 
who we have to put it in that kind of language, but if anyone is still awake who's watching after that reading, let me try and simplify this. It's a single-use plastic bag ban. And that basically means that when you go to the cash register at one of our grocery stores, I'll use this as an example, and you're at the cash register, when you used to be asked, do you want paper or plastic, it will now be paper or a very thick reusable bag that might be made out of plastic. That's basically what the ban is about. People have asked, well, what about you know, produce? Well, it was right in there, it probably slipped by. But if it's interior in the store, if you're going to stop and shop, say, I'm not pushing stop and shop, but if you have to go there and you go to the produce section, there are very thin plastic bags. So those are not banned under this ordinance. So that's essentially what the ordinance is. There were a couple of other things in Councilor Adams, if I miss a few of these, Toward the end, a lot of the things about if there is hardship. So we tried to write this ordinance so that if there are not substitutes that are readily available, we're saying, look, we're going to take that into account. So that's why we talked about things like the newspapers, which are in the thin plastic bags. But that would really be a hardship. There is not a substitute that wouldn't dramatically change the commercial operation of already a struggling business, which are local newspapers. Or there is in the exemption for dry cleaners. There is not an easy substitute right now. So that's why those are, in, are not included in the ban. So we tried to make this, and that it also include deferments, that if somebody feels that this ban creates an economic hardship, we are trying to write in this. You heard a number of ways in which they can request deferments. We think we've been very liberal in that policy. So essentially, it's at point of sale when you go to the cash register that those bags will be banned. And before I go on, um, Councilor Adams, do you have anything else you'd want to add to what kind of the, the, the commonplace language of that ordinance would be? Um, no, you've hit the major points. You can go ahead. Okay. You still have the floor if you want it. Okay, so I'll take the floor to just kind of say, well, where did this come from and why are we doing it? And I said in the... Uh, public forum we had on this that we are often the one of the leaders in environmental ordinances and we've kind of taken pride in that we actually are not a leader on this one anymore this is not something that's radical and it, about five years ago the idea of this came up and at that time even I was like I don't know if we're ready to do this and now we're kind of like we're kind of just joining the parade so if you'll see I passed out for all the counselors some of my talking points here but right now we have the European Union, 340 million people, there's a ban on single-use plastic bags. China, a billion people. China, not a particularly environmentally progressive country, has banned the use of single-use plastic bags. Mexico City, 40 other countries. The state of California last summer banned the use of single-use plastic bags. Many communities in Massachusetts have now banned them. The state legislature, it's been sitting in committee for a couple of years, and I've been assured that it's going to be moving. So we're looking at it at this eventually, that the whole state will ban this. And my guess would be in five or 10 years, we're going to probably see the whole country will be banning this. Even the state of Texas right now has a ban that has already moved out of committee and is moving forward in the state of Texas. And then the question is, well, why? Why, are we, why is this happening? Well, one of the reasons it's happening, and I think one of the most startling statistics is just the number of these bags and what happens to them. And when we use these bags, unlike a lot of things that many of us have become kind of like, okay, we can recycle that. These bags are recycled at an incredibly low rate. Some folks say two or 3%, I'm gonna be generous and say about 5%. And the reason, and this is even with the manufacturers of the bags putting a ton of money into recycling programs, especially they tried this in California because they were trying to say, look, people are recycling the bands. So they put a lot of money, a lot of time. When they looked down the road a few years ago and said, hey, California may ban this, they tried to say, well, we're going to show you these bags can be recycled. It still didn't change anything. OK, so then the question is, well, if they're not being recycled, what happens? Well, what happens is that these billions of bags end up all over the place. Yeah, a lot of them end up in a landfill, but that's even costly for communities. You just heard that we're going to start, we are shipping our, our stuff up to New York State. 
because now when we're going to be closing the landfill, well, guess what? When we start shipping that with millions of bags and the city of Northampton, and this was, when I heard this figure a few years ago, I said, could this possibly be true? And when I found out it was, I said, now the magnitude of the problem really hits home. The city of Northampton uses approximately, the citizens here use approximately 12 to 15 million single-use plastic bags a year, the thin bags. And so we're going to be paying for that. That's something we're paying for. It's going to increase cost of when we ship this stuff out of state. In addition to that, when these items, and you've probably seen them, I got one call out of all the scores of calls I've got all in support. I did have one call, which I was kind of glad about. It was a good call of somebody who was saying, I oppose this. That was just yesterday. I happened to be on a bike ride. And he was saying, I don't see why we're doing that. I never see these bags anywhere. And as I'm riding along and I'm looking down, there are single-use plastic bags. And I actually looked up in a tree and I saw a single-use plastic bag. And I think everybody's had that experience. So these bags are everywhere. Unfortunately, one of the places they end up and one of the most environmentally damaging places they end up are in our water. And they are not only in our fresh water, but especially in the oceans, where they biodegrade, but they don't complete, they don't really biodegrade. They break down into small, incredibly small plastic particles, which end up in marine life. And that's why both the UN and our own, I have it down here, the name that the UN uh, Ocean Protection Council uh, called, for, and the UN Environmental uh, Secretariat have called for a worldwide ban on these is mostly because of what happens in the oceans. So not only are they filling our landfill, are they costly, they're environmentally really damaging. And the fact, and one other statistic, that just in the city of Northampton, so we talk about carbon footprint, the use of these bags, and I think my math is right, if you translate it, our use of these bags is the equivalent of us driving 600,000 miles in a car. That's how much petroleum it takes just for our city. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking, and we as a city have very much been a leader in looking at climate change, what we can do, what we can do to mitigate it, preparing for it, and also what we can do to lower our carbon footprint. And this is one way we can do it. It's time has come. There are, this is something that years ago, when these plastic bags were first introduced, the folks producing these actually had to do a real marketing campaign because nobody wanted them. Nobody wanted to use the plastic bag. Everybody, remember what, we all used paper? Do you remember when in the big supermarkets, especially all of them, when they'd say, plastic or paper, paper or plastic? You'll notice in the last few years, they don't even ask you anymore. The default is plastic and you have to ask for the paper. What has happened in communities that start to do things like ban the single-use plastic bags is that it also encourages what we all really need to do, which is start bringing our own bags. And the supermarket then saves money. Because don't forget, when we use these bags, whether they're paper or plastic, that cost gets translated back to us. They're not free bags. We pay for it in the operation of that store and the increased cost of our food. So as more and more of us start to bring our own bags, which they've at its stop and shop when they experimented and encouraged people to do that four years ago, the use rate was almost 40%. And they only did that for a little bit of time. So you heard one of our local store owners tonight speak in public session that they haven't used plastic bags at all. And we've got most of our local grocery stores have already, already leading the way. And they're doing just fine by not using these single-use plastic bags. So I hope everybody will support this tonight. Uh, Council Adams. The only thing that I would add is I, I think this is a major legislative accomplishment. I'm very proud this is a council-driven initiative. And uh, Councilor Spector and I sp spent well over a year uh, with this. And it was, it was a huge, huge and <coughs> long and tedious effort for us to research this and draft it and reach out to the public and um, hear back and, and make uh, concessions and, and um, amendments. And, and I think it was a good process, and I think that this will go a long way to, to um, demonstrate our commitment to environmental protection, solid waste reduction, and sustainability, and take part in this global effort. Councilor Klein. Um, well, I'm really thrilled that this is being introduced. I think it's a very important uh, piece of legislation, so thank you to the councilors. Um, I, this has been a real... Uh, 
kind of passionate passion issue for me because um, I serve as a volunteer for the Western Massachusetts Bag Share Project, oh. which is a project that sews uh, reusable cloth bags and distributes them among mm -hmm. stores, local stores for uh, use. People take them uh, home with their groceries to hold their groceries and then bring them back to the store so that they're in constant use. Cereos, Cornucopia, uh, Florence Hardware, a number of stores um, in Northampton and Florence are working with the Bag Share Project. Um, and in fact, we have calculated in the last five years, we've kept six million plastic and paper bags out of our landfill and local waste streams locally with the Bag Share Project. And I just want to add to some of the statistics that we use in the Bag Share Project to what Councillor Spector shared. Um, Let's see. So as, as of the end of 2014, 132 cities and uh, counties in 18 states and the District of Columbia have instituted similar measures to this one. Um, but as Councillor Spector said, the European Union, China, India, dozens of other nations have already banned plastic bags or they have taxes in place. Um, annually around the world we consume one trillion plastic bags and only 3.5 of them are recycled as Councillor Spector uh, alluded to. In Northampton the percentage is a little higher. Um, we've calculated that only about 5% of plastic bags are recycled. It's a little higher than the national average but it's uh, not much higher. Um, as Councillor Spector also alluded to, plastic bags can take up to a thousand years to decompose, and in the process, they release toxins into the soil and water. Um, in every square mile of ocean, there are 46,000 pieces of floating plastic, and sea turtles are killed at alarming rates. They eat only jellyfish, and they think plastic bags are jellyfish, and they consume them and die. Um, in one study that was done at the national level in the United States, 90% uh, of birds were found to have small pieces of plastic in their, um, in their stomachs, in their bodies. Um, and something else that Councillor Spector started to speak about was that uh, another reason for banning plastic bags is their fossil fuel burden. Plastic is not only made from petroleum, but also in the, the process of creating the bags, mm -hmm. petroleum is used. It's a fossil fuel derived energy that creates the, the plastic bags. Um, and the production of plastic bag uses 10% of the world's oil supply, and that's 12 million barrels of oil a year. Uh, and then I just want to talk about the, the waste reduction piece. The plastic bag tax that was started in Ireland, uh, they did a study after 10 years. It's, it was started in 2002. In 2012, they found that it had led to a 95% reduction in plastic bag litter in all over Ireland. A study in San Jose, California, where they instituted a ban in 2011, found that plastic litter reduction um, there was a reduction of approximately 89% in its storm drain system, 60% reduction in its creeks and rivers, and 59% reduction of plastics in city streets and neighborhoods. So actually creating these bands keeps all of this out of our waste streams, out of our, uh, off our streets, um, out of our rivers, all of that. Um, and just another, to, to finish up here, the Bagshare project that I work with, um, has also figured out that in the lifetime of a reusable cloth bag like the ones that we sew in the Western Massachusetts uh, Bag Share Project will supplant the use of an average of, <coughs> excuse me, over 400 plastic bags. Um, so I also just want to encourage people to take a look and to volunteer. Um, we do a monthly bag share project, uh, sew at my house, and I invite people to call and come and sew with us. And you can look at uh, www.thebagshare.org to get more information and to participate in their sewing circles all around um, Western Massachusetts. <coughs> so I thank you both, Councillor Spector and Adams, and I will support this. Um, at this time, before further comments, I'm just going to introduce a couple letters that were sent for, for the public record. Sure. Um, this is, um, dear council, we strongly uh, endorse the bag ordinance. We cannot be present in person, so please read the attached letter into the record of the council meeting. And then, of course, I don't have the attachment. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Um, I have it, Bill. Do you want me to? Do you have the attachment? Yeah. Would you be so kind as to read it? 
you have another one to read in the meantime while I pull it up? Yep. Yeah, I have, uh, I have the, the stop and shop one. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read the stop this one. This is uh, dated April 7th, 2015. And dear, dear members of the City Council of Northampton, my name is Joni Martino. I'm the stop and shop store manager at 228 King Street on behalf of the stop and shop uh, supermarket company LLC. We have concerns with Ordinance 272-18, <coughs> the proposal to ban the use of carry-out plastic bags. Stop and Shop is strongly committed to being a sustainable company and protecting the environment. We strongly believe that educating and encouraging our customers to recycle is the best solution to aid in the protection of the environment. And we know that promoting the proper disposal and recycling and recycling materials is important. We encourage our customers to use reusable bags. Reusability reduces both plastic and paper bag usage. Uh, recently, Stop and Shop has introduced a new economical plastic reusable bag option for our customers. It retails for only 10 cents each. It is 100% recyclable and is 2.5 mils thick. It has a reusability rate of 8 to 12 on the average. We have a program in place. <coughs> we have programs in place to recycle plastic bags and corrugated cardboard boxes. Um, there's a bullet point. All four, all of our 400 plus stores, including the 131 stores in Massachusetts, accept plastic bags from consumers for recycling. Council respect referred to this. Uh, we have collection bins in the front of each store, which collect thousands of pounds of plastic bags each year. The plastic bags are sent to a recycling vendor where they're recycled into uh, composite lumber and other recycled commodities. And more than 50%, and this is the other bullet point, more than 50% of cardboard, paper, plastic, and other waste is recycled from our stores. We have a program in place that recycles old shrink wrap and corrugated boxes from our stores and distribution center. Also, Stop and Shop is a leader in innovating and building sustainable operations to, our, uh, to lower our environmental impact in each market we serve. Some more bullet points. New stores are built to reduce their energy consumption by 20 percent. We have 230 stores that meet the Energy Star criteria by EPA. Stop and Shop and its sister companies underneath A Hold, really, USA, uh, hold the distinction of oper operating the largest fleet of LEED certified grocery stores in the U.S. Um, Several stores utilize solar panels, which generate around 8% of the store's electricity needs, and we continue to expand their use into new stores. And one of our newest stores in Whalen, Mass, features electric vehicle charging stations. We oppose an, an adoption of this proposal and would like to partner with the town of Northampton, city of Northampton, uh, to educate and promote recycling in the town. Thank you for the opportunity to submit this testimony respectfully, uh, Joni Martin. Can May I speak directly to that letter before you well, read the next one? Uh, <coughs> why, don't, why, don't I, why don't I do this one too, and then you can speak to them all in the hall. Okay. That, I, I just don't want people to forget some of what you read in that letter, and I'm, I'm going to even afraid. forget it. Exactly. Right, you have the letter. Okay. You might have to pass it. I, I appear to, to refresh it. So. Okay. Um, and this is the letter. Um, this is from the Sierra Club. Uh, dear counselors, the Massachusetts chapter of the Sierra Club commends the efforts of the council to restrict the use of single-use polyethylene bags. Plastic bags are one important part of the effort to reduce unnecessary plastic waste. The Massachusetts Sierra Club endorses Ordinance 272-18 as currently written. In particular, we recommend three mills as the cutoff for reusable bags and are pleased that the city is joining with its sister cities of Newburyport, Newton, and most recently Cambridge in adopting this strong definition. Northampton residents use an estimated of 750,000 polyethylene shopping bags per month. Only 5% are recycled. Eliminating bags from the waste stream will be a significant positive environmental action. Eliminating non-biodegradable packaging, packaging will also beautify the city of Northampton by reducing the unsightly and ultimately permanent thin plastic bags of, of cost. The ordinance allows alternatives that are highly reusable and or made of natural, biodegradable, and renewable uh, materials. This move to better packaging will enhance the sustainability of Northampton retailers. We believe the city is allowing adequate time to make the transition to these readily available alternatives. This transition is getting easier and faster, especially for the large chain stores that account for the vast majority of existing thin plastic bags. <coughs> Since similar laws are being successfully implemented in a growing number of communities across the Commonwealth and across the around the country, 
We hope they will make the changes the change as soon as possible. We also urge supermarkets in the city to maintain polyethylene bag recycling as long as they distribute other recyclable bags, such as produce bags and bread bags. Such programs have been maintained in other communities that have, that have adopted similar laws. We ask you to vote in favor of this ordinance respectfully. Emily Norton, Mass Sierra Club Chapter Director. Councilor Spector. Uh, if I, could I have a copy of I, I can't which, which one you the want? Stop and shop letter. But as Councilor Dwight, um, I don't have, I don't you don't have, have a, a copy. copy. I've got an electronic copy. Okay, I'll try and remember from it. I'll see if I can pull it up. Uh, it ties into something else. Uh, Councilor Adams, I think it was a year and a half ago we started on this ordinance. And when we began, we thought at that time there was another process moving forward, and that was about the, the need for stormwater. And we watched that process, which took a long time and educated the public, and we thought, you know, whether you agreed with the, the final um, need for the stormwater fee or not, I think everyone would agree that we had a great deal of publicity about it, a, a, a kind of education process. And we said, that's a model for us. We really want to reach out. We want to try and especially reach out to, we, were, we actually sat there and had meetings saying, who might object to this and why? And we should talk to them and find out how we can work together. We reached out to all the big supermarkets here in multiple ways both with phone calls, I went there personally. Nobody talked to us. We left messages, nobody called us back. So it's a little, this letter actually came to me the day of the public forum, which was last week. That was a year and a half ago, and it was multiple times, not a single time, because I'd call Councillor Adams and I said, well, have you heard back from so-and-so? And he'd say no, so I would try and call. We also reached out to the chamber, and we thought, well, if we reach out to the Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Development Committee, so I called Suzanne Beck, and she was you know, very helpful, I said, look, we want to work with businesses in the community. We want to find out, you know, because this might affect them, although all of our research showed <coughs> that it has a minimal effect, that there are, there are substitutes. And as Councillor Adams alluded to, the couple of businesses, local businesses that called us who had concerns and they raised them, we actually dropped parts of a much bigger ordinance because we said, you know what? They're right, this might be onerous right now. There aren't substitutes for some of the other things that we were gonna include in the ordinance. And so we really looked at the economic impact. And the, from the chamber, we actually, I went and I met with the Economic Development Committee of the chamber, who was very supportive, and I said, look, do you think you could reach out, especially to the big supermarkets, who are the ones who use the most of these single-use plastic bags, and who historically, as we watch other communities, have been the ones who write letters like these or object. We said, this was eight months ago, maybe a year ago. Could you set up a meeting, and we'd like to come and talk to them and explain what we're doing and have a conversation about it? Back in the fall, I, I had to be the one who called again to the chamber and say, well, what's happening with the meeting? And they said, well, we've reached out to the businesses and we're going to have a meeting, but they don't want you to come. So I find this letter rather ingenuous because we were willing to discuss this. And embedded in that letter, one place, which is the Stop and Shop talks about their recycling. And this is where uh, it's a little bit tricky with their language. They, they talk about how good they are at recycling. And they talk about recycling 50% of cardboard, plastic, other waste is recycled from our stores, which is fantastic. I'm so glad they do that. Notice that they give you no percent of what they recycle in terms of plastic bags. And the reason is, even if they're doing incredibly well, even if they're doing better than any place in the country has ever done, I guarantee you that is way under 10%. And so the fact is, they're not recycled. I'm glad they're doing these other things, but they realize that this is a product that they're, being, that they're using that has easy substitutes. When they talk about going to reusable bags, all the research shows this will help them to do it. Their own experiment at their own store in Northampton showed that when they put just a little bit of effort into encouraging people to bring <coughs> reusable bags, cloth bags, like the counselor talked about, that this town responds incredibly in the long run, saves them a lot of money. So that's what I just wanted to say about our outreach. And we have tried to do outreach all year in multiple ways. So, I did have, in the same call of the one call that was opposed, said, well, I, didn't, I haven't heard anything about this. This process, this shouldn't vote on this tonight because the process, you know, I said, wait a minute, this is, there have been two or three articles just in the Gazette alone. There was an editorial on the Gazette. 
there's been at least two or three times there have been stories on the radio, and I believe Councilor Adams was at the radio. We've had public forums. We've reached out to every one of the committees and sent emails and reached out for over a year and a half. So if folks haven't heard about it, they probably also don't know that the Red Sox season has started again. So. Uh, Councilor Shara. Yeah. Um, I, I want to thank you both for this labor of love and all the work and time you put into it. And kind of along these lines, um, I watched how much work you put into and concern about particularly small local businesses. And, and actually, in this time period, one of the small local businesses that, that we were concerned about, Cereos, has leapfrogged over this and yeah. <laughs> now uh, has no ba bags except for bag share bags, um, has gotten rid of their styrofoam, has gotten rid of all of that kind of packaging. So um, this is very possible uh, for businesses to do this. And, and um, I, I hope that we are all moving in the direction that Syria is the, the initiative that they've already taken upon themselves. Councilor Klein. Well, just um, to follow up on the point about um, retailers that are not able to withstand this um, situation, uh, it's really interesting because I think, um, let me see, I have statistics for the U.S. In the United States, retailers spend uh, at least $4 billion a year on plastic bags, and they purchase over 380 billion plastic bags. So that if in a small city like Northampton, where you have access to something like the Bag Share Project, to all kinds of alternatives, people that bring their own bags fairly regularly, it's actually, it's it will save retailers money. It will be a boon to retailers. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, I think, shifting kind of consciousness of how we um, sell things, how people leave their homes to go shopping. Um, and all of those things are doable. And in fact, you know, we have all of these models of other cities, other countries, the entire European Union that have done it successfully. So um, I think that we have, we have some really good models for how it can be done. Councilor LaBarge. Thank you. I want to thank both of you, Councilors and Councilor Spector, for giving us such a great detail on the ordinance. I've had some people who did call me and wanted to know what the purpose of this was. I support this 100%. To me, it's almost what we went through with the landfill, with the expansion over the Barnes Aquifer protecting the wall. <coughs> I agree with you about the plastic bags. They're ridiculous. <laughs> And so many of my friends and so many people I know in this city said it would be the greatest thing that we get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And I have to agree with that also. And I like the idea of the group that the consular was talking about, sewing bags and so forth. I will support this. Um, I should, uh, first of all, um, mentioned that some of the objections that I've heard. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll preface by saying I'm in full support of this. I've been working with the counselors as, as they've been shepherding this through. But um, there have been some concerns expressed. One was expressed by a, a business owner in Thorns, uh, who you heard at the, at the meeting, which was that it would put him at a competitive disadvantage. Although, I, in further discussion with him afterwards, uh, because he buy, he says he buys his bags in bulk up front and at a surplus system and they're they're very cheap that he would have to start um, he would have to raise his prices accordingly but as I pointed out and he, and he thought that that would drive customers to uh, surrounding communities where a ban does not exist um, and by the way the stop and shop letter while expressing that they were opposed I never heard um, anything substantive that spoke in about their objection. It was weird. They just listed everything that they did, all the good things that they do, that I hope they continue to do, but it didn't say why this would be onerous or why they would object. It's just simply that they did object. That was that kind of struck me. But um, this particular gentleman was speaking of a legitimate concern. He is, he's uh, an established business here in the community. And my point to him was, I, I said, I'm not sure about the difference uh, in, in, in the increase in the concern that it would drive other your customers away. But I have to believe that per purchase that we're talking about in the area of about a penny at the most. And 
while there are a lot of discerning shoppers in the area, I don't think people make their shopping decision predicated on that cent, on that penny. That uh, that penny, if they drove to another community, would be a lot bigger in fuel costs alone, and just to, just to try and save that cent. He allowed that, that he accepted that, but the fact is, he he just felt that he just had a ge general bad feeling about it. And I thought that it was it was appropriate to share that. Mm -hmm. um, the discussion beyond that, the discussion has been uh, t t to virtually everyone, with the exception of a few citizens, been uh, the support that you've heard reflected tonight. Um, there were some concerns that I raised with Councilor Specter. There are a number of people who, uh, senior citizens in particular, who are who express some concern because they rely on the plastic bags when they walk to the store and walk back because if it's raining or it's inclement that the paper bags would tear and it's difficult for them to carry those. And I, I think you were going to do some follow-up at the, the Council on Aging. Um, I, and I was wondering if you had any response to that. Well, one of the things with Council on Aging is, and I spoke to them, is to try and, I didn't know you were involved in the group, but to have a program of getting seniors reusable bags, which are so much sturdier than even the plastic, because I don't know if anyone here has had like eight of those, I mean, they seem to you come out with like 12 plastic bags. They're not easy to juggle, but to have really sturdy reusable bags like you guys are providing. So I'm going to follow up and talk to the, the, the you know, Council on Aging and see how can we somehow help people get those bags and provide them with the bags. I suspect that um the absence of objection doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't exist out there, as you discovered when somebody says, this is the first I've heard of it and you're rushing it right. through. This is, I should point out, Councilor Specter is right, this is nowhere near rushing anything. And this is the, in fact, actually some people look at this as the slow grind of, of municipal law. But implementation will certainly bring some objections. I think you'll start to hear people who might not otherwise pay attention to the news who go into a Cumberland Farms and are used to getting their stuff, and then they say, I'm sorry, we don't have a plastic bag for you. Um, then you're going to start to hear some stuff about that, and I'm sure you've anticipated yep. that as a possibility. So um, one objection, since you're wait raising some, or it, it wasn't an objection, but a concern, one group are dog owners, because dog owners use a lot of these bags. And I just want to clarify, because when I explain to them, well, they can still buy their own roll of these very thin bags, which are very cheap for use with their dogs to pick up the waste. So they were concerned that all of these, be you know, you couldn't even buy these bags, and that is not the case. So I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, as in, that's the other group. I've heard some objection or some concern. I wouldn't even say these folks objected to it. They just said, what am I going to use? I, I recommend they subscribe to the local paper, the paper record, and that they, yeah. they will get a plastic bag with each delivery and that they, they will have an opportunity to be edified and find out, get up to speed on these items, and then also have that's right an additional bag to pick up after their hey, dogs. Let with. me just emphasize: the, the, I'd say something I've heard a number of times is, "Well, more." And this was even true. So I was kind of prepared with all of my talking points. These were when I went to the Chamber's Economic Development Committee because I thought they were going to object or have strong objections and questions. They were like, "Why aren't you including?" the newspaper, the plastic that the newspapers come in. Why aren't you including the cleaning, the cleaning bags? And I tried to explain that to the economic chamber group that it was economically onerous, that we were not trying to create a situation. There aren't substitutes. There really aren't today for the plastic round paper. And you could say, well, we should reinstitute. Remember, when, Marianne, when we were growing up, they are paper boys, and they don't exist anymore. And so if the paper is going to be out there, it's very difficult to run the business without doing that. Hopefully, in a few years, that will change, and there will be a bag for that. But we actually, that was more objections about we're not doing enough than the very few objections or concerns about the ban itself. And the last thing I would point out, and I think it's mentioned, but the, the currently is percolating in the state. And the legislature is a statewide ban. One advantage, although I don't know if we can actually translate that to people who might think differently, but this actually prepares Northampton to uh, and, and businesses and the community 
to be ahead of the curve when it seems likely the the ban the statewide ban takes effect. Um, then that competing interest falls away, and that it, but we'll we'll be a far ahead of that. We'll have our reusable bags and our sewn bags well in place by the time uh, the statewide ban comes through. Um, anyone else have any comments or thoughts on this? Uh, Councilor Adams. Uh, a couple early amendments based on Scrivener's errors. Okay. But, yeah, there's some Scrivener's errors, just some omissions that you want us to add on the, on the language. Hit it. Section 2.3, last sentence. A reusable bag may be, word B is left out, if we could add that, please. And 7.4, first, first line, <coughs> after all information necessary left out for the health department, words for the should be between necessary and health. Then at, right after that, health department, right after department should be, <coughs> or mayor's designee. And then in 7.5, mayor's designee, designee should be a capital D. I'm just wondering about in 5.3 and 5.4, you reiterate, it says uh, payment shall be made within 21 days to the city clerk in 5.3 and then 5.4, I mean, it's a different way of saying it, but you're saying the same thing. Violators shall have 21 calendar days. What happened <laughs> yeah, <laughs> after right. the date that a notice of violation is issued to pay the penalty? Just delete, delete 5.4. I mean, maybe you want to make it clear and take it out of 5.3 and then just because it, it no. Why is it doing that? Uh, well, first of all, those, those, those are by the proponent. Those, those corrections are by the proponent. Um, so I don't think it requires a vote. There are scrivener's errors. So. Councilor Spector. I just thank someone who was here tonight, Jessica Tanner, because she did a good deal of grunt work for me, especially. She called me up. She's very interested in this and helped helped us move this along in terms of some of the technical issues, including the the mill size of the bag. So I want to just thank her for her help. And, and Jessica, we, I could have used your help moving that plastic <laughs> bag ball through the. With. <laughs> Councilor Specter and I ended up hauling all around town. So. All right. All right. So there no, no further debate or discussion. Uh, okay. Roll call, please. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Scherer. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Well, that passes in first reading, and right. the next reading will come up Eight zero at our right. council, first council meeting in May. Seven. Um, zero. Next up, we have an ordinance pertaining to campaign. Well, we're going to strike. It says spending, but we're going to make it con contributions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Changing the language to say ordinance pertaining to campaign contribution limits, um, and that uh, was returned from the committee on rules, orders, and ordinances without recommendation. And this is the first reading, and actually, here let me give you the language on this that. My uh, computer doesn't crash. Come on, come on, do it. Pam, do you have a paper copy? I do. Oh, link's not going to be. Did 
to the theme of the night has been the waste stream, but uh, the, now this is the funding stream, and the, we have actually these are both the the ordinances we've been dealing with are pretty significant. So um, this is upon the uh, recommendation of Council Ryan O'Donnell and the Council President William H. Dwight and the Councilor Gina Louise Shara. Uh, this is a uh, uh, an ordinance of the City of Northampton. <coughs> Massachusetts be ordained by the City of Council of the City of Northampton the City Council assembled as follows that the following chapter be added to the Code of Ordinances. Chapter 151, Campaign Finance. No candidate or candidate's committee shall accept campaign contributions from any individual if the aggregate of all such contributions by that individual for the benefit of that candidate or that candidate's committee exceeds in any calendar year a sum equal to one half of the maximum aggregate individual contribution allowed per calendar year as specified in Mass General Law Chapter 55, Section 7A. Two, candidates for mayor shall provide the city clerk with a copy of their reports that have been filed with the Massachusetts Office of Campaign and Political Finance. Three, the city clerk shall, with, uh, shall within 15 days inspect all statements and reports of the municipal candidates or candidate uh, candidates committees if upon uh, examination of the records it appears that any candidate or political committee has reported the receipt of contributions in excess of the limits defined in section 1 the city clerk shall in writing notify the candidate candidates shall have 15 days to purge all excess contributions by returning them to the individual who made them or donating them to a local charity operating in the city of Northampton any person failing to purge the excess contributions within such time shall have a complaint filed against him. Are we being gender specific? Is that the law? Uh, in the District uh, Court of Northampton, and if found guilty, shall be punished by a fine not exceeding $300 or some equal to the ex uh, excess contributions, whichever is greater. I'll accept the motion and put that on the floor. So moved. Second. Uh, <laughs> I'll throw it down. Sure. Um, well, maybe I'll start with a request for a technical amendment since uh, the subject of the techni technical amendment popped out to you in the course of, of reading it. And then that way we can debate an ordinance that is well formed. Um, and that is the last sentence um, that you just read, which was um, any person failing to purge excess contributions within such time should have a complaint filed against him in the District Court of Northampton and if found guilty shall be punished by a fine not exceeding $300 or some equal to the excess contribution, whichever is greater. That sentence should simply read, any person failing to purge excess contributions within such time shall be subject to a fine not exceeding $300. Um, and should that be seconded or? Um, that, uh, that's a significant um, okay. amendment. So um, that motion is made to amend. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the amendment? Just not only do we remove the, the, the gender issue, but we, we can't charge over $300 generally in terms of a fine. Um, and so this this amendment comes with the approval of the solicitor. Any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? OK. And now do you want to speak to the general order? Sure. Um, well, thank you. I think that. Um, this is an interesting ordinance because it's, I think it's a good opportunity for the city. I think we often debate large issues, um, but we don't often have the chance to um, enact an ordinance that has a substantive effect on those issues. And I think you just saw with this ban on plastic bags that from time to time we're able to actually do that. That's an ordinance that has uh, an immediate effect on our city in a, in a very positive way. And I'm hoping that um, uh, other members of the council see the same thing that I do in this ordinance uh, regarding campaign contributions. I'd like to describe just the background of the problem we're facing generally um, today in, in, in our country and in our, in our commonwealth and kind of describe a scale of problems starting from the, the huge down to, um, down to the smaller level. The hugest example I can point to will probably come as no surprise to anyone, which was the Citizens United decision from um, several years ago, which, much like plastic bags, has dumped um, a different kind of refuse into <laughs> not our oceans, but into our democracy, and has created the age of the super PAC 
and I think um, actually severely damaged um, politics and the ability of, of regular everyday people to participate in civic discourse um, the way they should be able to. But that's not the only problem that we've seen in recent years. There was a similar landmark Supreme Court decision that followed on the heels of Citizens United um, called McCutcheon versus the Federal Election Commission, which continued on the same path mm -hmm. of, of empowering um, wealthy donors and, um, in this case, specifically wealthy donors who want to keep giving more and more. And then we move down to the level of, of Massachusetts, and we see just recently that uh, there is an out-of-state think tank actually based in Arizona. Uh, it's called the Goldwater Institute, so you can, you can guess by the name that they're very neutral and non-ideologically driven. Um, that's sarcasm for the, for the <laughs> purpose of the minutes. Noted. Um, and they have come out and, and brought a lawsuit against Massachusetts over our century-old ban on corporate contributions. Uh, it's a ban that 20 states in the United States have, as well as the federal government. And then you go a little bit lower, below that level, and you find that last year uh, the, the State House and Senate in Massachusetts passed a piece of legislation that did a lot of good things. In fact, it specifically dealt with some of the problems created by Citizens United and independent expenditures and, and disclosure issues. But it also um, doubled the amount of money that individuals can give to uh, candidates. It used to be $500. That was the amount that was in place since 1994, and it doubled to $1,000. So suddenly we find an alignment between our principles and talking about the big issues and an ordinance that we can actually enact that will have an effect. We can't overturn Citizens United uh, in Northampton, although there was a resolution uh, I think that uh, City Council President Bill Dwight uh, took the lead on, I think, in 2012 and made a statement about. But what we can do something about is set a different campaign finance system up for the city and municipal offices in a way that is not symbolic but very real. Um, and as the Council President explained by reading the ordinance, what this does is tie our limit for contributions to candidates for mayor, for city council, every municipal office to one half of the state level. Since the state level is now $1,000, it would be 500. It's actually not a very radical change. It's actually kind of no change relative to last year. It's just not an acceptance of doubling the amount of money in our local politics. Um, I, I, I think I'll kind of stop there. There are other issues to get into, but I actually very much am looking forward to the comments of, of other counselors on this. And I'd also like to thank Councilor Shara uh, for working on this ordinance, as well as Councilor Dwight. Um, and I guess I would just finally say that um, I, I think, not, not to repeat myself, but I think <coughs> this is an opportunity to, and no pun intended, to put our money where our mouth is and actually uh, enact an ordinance based on our values. Um, I'm not saying that people raise too much money or spend too much money in Northampton. We can debate that. But I actually prefer not to debate that. Um, I actually got a request to go through campaign finance records and present the number of instances of $500 contributions that all of us may have gotten or other candidates. And frankly, I just chose not to. Um, so you may hear in the course of this debate that um, money in politics isn't a problem in Northampton. And I would submit to you that that is not the issue. The real issue is what are our values? And can we take those values and, and translate them into a real campaign finance system that will serve the city? And I think this, uh, this is a new chapter in our code of ordinances. It's a framework we can use to discuss and determine what that um, system is for us. Council LaBarge. Yes. Um, looking at the attachment that apparently was sent from our city solicitor, Alan Seewald. And I had a talk with him today on this because I had great concerns of the language, he said, where I don't agree with her assessment, which he was talking about Margaret Hurley, the director of municipal law. Alan did tell me that someone could attempt to challenge this and it could go to court. 
and he explained to me the difference of this. And I also talked with another attorney today on this, that yes, it possibly could be challenged. And the difference is, if it's an election, you have a ballot and it has a person's name on it, we're talking about the finance part of it. So if something like this went to go to court, we would probably have a good luck to stand on it because there is a difference here between the election and a candidate's name or whatever they're running for. This is financing. And that's where Alan said that there could be a challenge. Right, for clarification, uh, Attorney Hurley submitted uh, um, what she thought was a case establishing precedence that was relevant to this. And the solicitor, and I believe Councilor O'Donnell and I agree that she was referring, it was a, a, a candidate, there was a special indication whether, on the ballot, it's indicated whether a candidate is an incumbent, but they want also want to include what that the candidate was a veteran, I believe it was. Yes, they would and, put that. Uh, that special designation is not allowed by state law. It didn't see, and this was a, a municipality trying to change the language and the way the ballots are presented. This has nothing to do with the ballot. This is campaign financing as opposed to elections, which you might say are inseparable, and, and unfortunately they are in some respect, which is part of the impetus for the, the generation of this. But the fact is it does, it, I don't see how that's particularly germane. As far as being challenged, everything we do, everything we vote on, everything we approve is subject to challenge. Um, and I think in, in, in doing so that we, we, are, we are projecting and proclaiming essentially what we believe is best for our community and whether it can sustain and survive if it doesn't run counter to Mass General Law. Mass General Law hasn't really addressed this. I don't think there, no one ever expected that a little tiny community would suddenly say, no, 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 we don't want that much money in our campaigns. A lot of this, and I think this comes from the fact that um, uh, this is a reflection of the way this state is structured. And most of the influence and most of the votes are all centered around Boston. Um, where it probably does cost more to run a campaign. I would imagine in Wellesley, if you know, it's it's probably the, the cost is more significant. It, they're probably spending untold thousands of dollars to run a, a citywide campaign. It's not the case here in Northampton. And um, the, the thing that's, I think, to the larger point that that Councilor O'Donnell brought up was the fact that. Money does have influence. A thousand dollars in this community would have, if not actual influence, it's certainly the appearance of influence. If one particular donor were to donate a thousand dollars to any one of our campaigns, that would be a significant amount of money. And it would be fair for the citizens to construe from that that there may be undue influence embedded in that donation. Um, we already get that with the five hundred dollars on some level. And, and I think that scrutiny is appropriate. That's why all these things are public record, so that we are subject to the scrutiny. It's, I am particularly proud of this state because we do have uh, some of the best campaign financing laws in the country. But the fact remains is if, and this is something that we've talked about um, when we're talking about compensation, <coughs> talking about uh, expansion of inclusion, uh, a more diverse body here in the council, um, and and more opportunities for people to consider running that we have to we we have to walk the talk and this in effect does just that it commits us to saying while we stand in opposition and that and that resolution that council o'donnell referred to was voted almost unanimously i think we had one dissenting vote um but it, we you know resolutions are easy there's no particular um you know, it's just speaking our resolve that doesn't necessarily uh, codify anything. This codifies it. <laughs> this has us own it. And I, in, in, I, was, I was glad to see him present this, and I was grateful for the opportunity to be a co-sponsor on this. Councilor Adams. No, oh, please. Um, two points. One is that um, the last time this was raised, the, the contributions were raised was 94, right? So, I mean... I, I do think that campaigns have cost more cost more to run now than they did over 20 years ago. Just just you know, I think that all the the costs of 
of everything have gone up from you know lawn signs to literature, but also 20 years ago, I don't think that um, technology was used as much. For example, I don't think candidates had you know websites, etc., to the greatest to, to the extent that they do now. And this doesn't really take that into consideration because it leaves it the same amount. But, but I don't really have a problem with that. Um, I just wanted to point it out that it doesn't really take into consideration the cost of campaigns have probably gone up substantially since in the last 20 years. But with respect to the legal issue, certainly any any uh, an, anything can be challenged. But I think it's slightly different when you have the attorney general telling you that it's illegal, and that's what we have here. Well, what I oh, oh, oh. Well, I don't think I'm sorry. It was just I, I, she did not. She opined that it was illegal. I mean, that's she, that's her in her opinion. It wasn't legal. I spoke to Alan C. All today, and the uh, attorney general's opinion, their office believes that it's illegal, and he believes it's legal. That's that's the clear conversation I had with Attorney Seagull. And and I would just feel more comfortable uh, if we had a a written memorandum of law from him. So before, just because um, you know, there's there's the AG saying it's not legal because they believe that it regulates um, elections and we can't do that. And Solicitor Seawald says uh, he has a different opinion. He believes that it's it's regulating just contributions. I think was his point that we can do that, and I think that that's I think that that's like a summary of the two different opinions. So I would just feel more comfortable if we had a written uh, opinion, a written memorandum from him before taking a, even a first vote on this, because I I, I would I would it, it, I I support the message of the ordinance and and um, it would be nice if it were unanimous. For my vote, I'd like to have that first. So that's my request. May I uh, offer some background? Yeah, please, on that? please. Um, I, I understand that sentiment completely. And I think um, what's at play here is the difference between a town and a city. Because as you know, um, any town bylaw pretty much has to be approved in advance by the Attorney General. And they do issue a written decision. That's not the case with the city ordinance. In fact, if you look at the plastic bag ban that Cambridge just passed, um, that ban actually has a component that ours doesn't, which is a, a requirement that paper bags have a fee. Now, there's nowhere in Mass General Law that provides the explicit authority for a city to charge a fee for a paper bag. But until uh, a court determines otherwise, then within the, the context of, of the Home Rule Act and the other restrictions that cities have, um, the Attorney General, and it's not the Attorney General herself, of course, it's, it's Margaret Hurley, Director of Municipal Law, of the Municipal Law Unit, who is offering kind of advisory kind of guidance. It's not a written opinion saying, no, this, is, this would be overturned. Until uh, you have something like that, or you have a decision by a court, then I think we are very much empowered, and not just empowered, um, we, we should be enacting ordinances that are in the best interest of the city. Um, I actually think that um, if it's dangerous, although I understand the need to be cautious, I think it's dangerous to read um, the Home Rule Act too narrowly. Um, and I think actually uh, the solicitor's opinion, it's not a full memo, but the substance is pretty well fleshed out, which is, and actually Councilor Barge pretty much summed it up well, I think. Um, there are ex explicit exemptions under the Home Rule Act, that, things that we can't do as a city, and elections is one of them. But this is not an elections issue. It's a campaign finance issue. Look at our zoning law. In our zoning law, we have regulations about how big a lawn sign can be. A lawn sign is, is re election related, <coughs> but no one would argue that the Home Rule Act says we can't you know, regulate lawn signs. And I'm not trying to draw a frivolous comparison at all. I'm just trying to provide background. I think that's how the solicitor looks at it. I certainly look at it that way. And so I feel we're actually on very, very firm legal ground in this regard. Councilor Kahn. Um, um, I guess <clears throat> to the councilor, would do you see any drawback in actually asking the solicitor to draw up a memo explaining and pointing, comparing the uh, AG's op uh, opinion on this matter to his own and just point by point for the record so that we had that? Do you see a drawback in having that for us for, for reference so that it's clear when we're, when we're voting on mm -hmm. this whether, you know, we are taking an action that may be in direct disagreement with the AG's office, but doing it anyway? 
Um, I think that's a, a good question. I guess the way I feel is that um, that has been that has been done. Um, the, the memo, I mean. Yeah, I, I feel the memo, the substance of that memo is oh. th that you may be looking for has been expressed by the solicitor, just not in a, in a multi-page document. I feel no, so that the point. just one sentence in an mm -hmm. email. Right? They just feel like, yeah. I think something is as, as important as this and as, as you've heard, as groundbreaking as this maybe warrants, uh, given the fact that there, there is an expressed direct contradiction between the opinion of the solicitor and the opinion of the AG's office, that just having something more substantive than the one sentence in an email, it, even if it's on letterhead and then just take that, something that we would have to, to point to, I think, do you see a drawback in that or, because there may be and that's what I'm asking, do you see is that maybe something that could detract or? Um, I, I, I don't see a drawback in more discussion on the, the legality. I guess I just, um, the Attorney General has not written, has not issued a written opinion of equal length that we would have to rebut. Could we ask so, for that? Could we ask just for something since we'd be, because we're being groundbreaking on this, rather than wait for it to be a, a court case, really kind of on the table, have things on the table right up front? Um, I guess, um, my, well, I mean, in theory, the, the solicitor could provide um, a great deal of legal information. Um, and so I guess it would be at what level a, a comfort level would be reached. And so, I mean, I'm not sure what that comfort level would be um, in this particular case, but there's certainly no drawback in more information. I feel the more information there is, I mean, I, th I feel the facts are firmly on our side. And right now, because there's no written objection from the Attorney General, I guess I would be uncertain why we would we would do that, but yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I agree with Councillor Carney. Solicitor Seawall writes very thorough memos, and they're and, and, and they're well written, and he cites all the law. And I do think that that's is greater for pre protection for us if this were challenged than his than his um, than just his mere opinion and um, you know inclination. I think there is a difference. As Councillor Carney said, particularly because there is there there is a there is a difference of opinion uh, with respect to the Attorney General. I think it's important for us, and I think it's um, I think it's worth uh, putting this off for that. I don't think we're in any great rush here. Um, the issue is under consideration, and I think it would only benefit us. Um, I'm assuming you're referring to this letter that I was CC'd on. Um Oh, no, I'm, you know what? I'm looking at the wrong one. I'm looking at the paid sick time one. I'm sorry. It's actually the, fir the first page. If you look at the electronic version of the ordinance as it's given to us, the first page of it is the um, Alan Seawald email where he says, attached is the revised version of the proposed campaign contribution limit ordinance that I have approved as to form with one caveat. I have discussed this proposed ordinance with Margaret Hurley, Director of Municipal Law Unit in the Office of the Attorney General. She has opined that this ordinance is not within the authority of the city to enact. I don't agree with her assessment, but there is some uncertainty in that regard. I'm, I'm less comfortable relying on this you know, two-sentence um, description of a conversation than something that actually is much more substantive so that when we do pass this, when we do, we have something that is clearly saying we disagree, if that's the case, we disagree with the opinion of Margaret Hurley or maybe Margaret Hurley would write for the purposes of the AG's office, but we could say the city of, we, city count this body disagrees with the opinion, if that's the case, and then it's on the table at front rather than having us wait for, you know, a possible court case. And, and then some of the legwork is actually done in advance. Councilor Specter hasn't spoken on this yet. I will speak to this. I just want to thank you first for bringing this up. And I have every intention to support it. However, I do agree because there doesn't seem to be a rush on this. Uh, I mean, we may even want to have... Um, our solicitor here at our next meeting so we can ask some I just want to get more of a feel on the on the mm -hmm. legal side mm -hmm. but again I really s want to support this I plan to support it mm -hmm. and I thank you for the work you've put into it but I I would think we should wait until we have a little more clarity around the legal piece 
Council of the Marsh. I have to agree with Councilman <coughs> Carney. I took it amongst myself because I was very unsure about this language that our city solicitor had stated. And I needed to know exactly what he meant by, I don't agree with her assessment, but there is some uncertainty in that regard. So how can you vote on something if you know what, don't know what the legality part of is it? If I had not called him, I wouldn't feel like the way I felt now, because I could vote on it, okay? Knowing that, yes, it could be challenged, but not to worry about it, because it's strictly financing. But either which way, if you want to have the city solicitor come in, that's fine with me. Count respect. Well, I just want to counsel your comments just then changed a little bit, because you're adding some more information, which maybe that I could support this night. You're saying you spoke to I our solicitor. He on my own because we were voting on this tonight, and I, I needed an explanation. I had called our council clerk in regards to well, what did you know our city solicitor have to say? And she just said that he had said that. I took it amongst myself to call him. Okay. So I have a question. Did, in ordinance, did the city solicitor was he there to answer any of these questions at the ordinance committee meeting? No. No, not in person. He reviewed it in advance. Right. Well, I, I I was at the ordinance committee meeting, and we pretty much relied on the conversations that Councilor O'Donnell had with the solicitor. At that time, I said, you know, I'd be a little bit more comfortable with a memo or something or hadn't seen uh -huh. that, but I think we decided to go ahead and let this come to the full council for some discussion about where we would, we would, where we would take this from okay. there. So, uh, Councilor Adams and then Councilor Spector. In, in my conversation with him today, he, he was very similar to when you were on the memo, just we had a 10 minute conversation. He said, he said, I'm not certain that this is legal. He said, I, I think it is. They think it's not. You never know till the person with the robe decides. That's what he said. So I mean, you know, I. It but uh, Council O'Donnell, you want to respond to that point? I, I would like to respond to that point. Um, I, I certainly wasn't in the conversation we had with the solicitor, but I'd be surprised if he said I don't know if it's legal. Um, the, the fact is that um, it's presumed that this is something we can do until a court says otherwise. Again, no city or town has done this, so it is not a risk of doing something illegal. I just want to be clear about that, um, fully um, understanding the, the, the need for more information um, from some if that's, if that's what they want, but we're not proposing to do anything illegal, and the solicitor doesn't believe that this is possibly illegal. It's not a risk that it's illegal. I'll try to okay. respond to that. Now, fortunately, I was taking notes during the conversation, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you exactly what he said. He's not certain to stand legal scrutiny. Now, if you want to make a distinction between that and it might not be legal, you can go ahead. But that's what he said. I do. So I would like an opinion from him. I mean, that, that's my perspective. Now, Council Respect. So I'm going to make a motion that we table this till till the next meeting. Second. Motions made table to table. There is no uh, debate. So roll call on the motion to table till the next meeting. Council Carney. Uh, yes. Council Dwight. No. Council Klein. No. Councilor Labarge? No. Councilor O'Donnell? No. Councilor Scherer? No. <coughs> Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. The motion fails. Um, so we're back to the regular order. Um, one of the things I can suggest, of course, is that uh, none of these things, tabling it doesn't, pr uh, the absence of a table doesn't preclude the solicitation of an opinion. So we can. We're coming back. At second reading. We're coming back at second reading. That's exactly right. So that we can have, we can have asked the solicitor. To Could you, you do that? I, yeah. I request that That's you do good. that. That's good. Yeah. So I, I will ask the solicitor for a more fleshed out formal opinion. Oh, I meant the attorney general. I wanted you. No. You I'm want me to kidding. go ask the attorney general? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, it, it, the Attorney General, <laughs> the transmissions that I've been subject, that I've had an opportunity to read from the Attorney General is. Uh, office is that they're kind of reluctant to actually opine on yes, the issue. I the city they, they, they have sort of said, and they brought up a precedent case, which 
I'm inclined to agree with the solicitor based on reading it is it, that there's no corollary. No. I understand what she's sort the of saying. The solicitor. So in my guess is that he will, in in the process of developing them, follow up with Attorney Hurley, and we'll see. So um, I will. So knowing that I will make a request of, of the solicitor to present us with a formal memo describing his concerns, if any, and his interpretation of how this might present. Um, that's Again, just to be clear. Could you ask him to contrast his opinion? between the Attorney General's office, as he understands it, just from the information he's received from the AG's office and his. That would be a more thorough memo just to show this is what the Attorney General's office has said regarding this matter. This is okay. my opinion. I will, this is yeah, it. All right. That would be more helpful for me. Um, that said, we're now, uh, Councilor Klein, you haven't spoken on this issue yet. I just have a question for Councilor, all the Councilors that co-sponsored this. Do, we don't have any precedents throughout the state of Massachusetts of any other city, small or large, that has taken on a similar kind of uh, ordinance? Well, the one similar ordinance, which is not quite the same kind of area of law, is Somerville, which um, has a, a distinction for developers. It's more part of their zoning code. So if you want to get a, a permit in Somerville and you're a developer, you, you, have, you have special restrictions. So, but questions. in terms of campaign finance reform, we have not seen anything like this in any city in Massachusetts yet. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and the Somerville <clears throat> some, uh, developers are precluded from donating. They have to register, and then they're precluded from donating. Uh, there's, there's a cap. So, uh, um, so that was a special financing law that was created, which would probably be more relevant uh, to financing as opposed to elections. But there's no other. Um, no other precedent so far. I just I, I find the um, attorney general's office uh, opinion a little bit odd because um, there are many precedents, not in Massachusetts, albeit, but there are many precedents of cities around the United States that, in fact, have passed similar kinds of legislate pieces of legislation and. Um, that may be not in accordance with what the state has set out as the, the campaign finance limit. So um, I can't imagine that Massachusetts is going to be different in that sense. Yeah, uh, if I may, I, I agree. And to that point, one of the benefits of what we're doing is that we may expand what the city, what its acknowledged cities and towns can do. Wouldn't that be a good outcome as well, mm -hmm. to do that and have other cities follow suit if they want? It could be wonderful if Northampton could be a precedent setter in this regard. I, know. I agree. Call a question. Mm -hmm. Call the question. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sharon. Yes. Councilor Specter. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Passes uh, unanimously in first reading, and it will be subject to uh, another vote on. Our first meeting in May, and uh, hopefully with a memo from the solicitor predating that, and we'll have an opportunity to review that. Thank you. Oh boy, my battery is dying fast. So thank God we're getting near the end. This is uh, a personal battery. Well, no, no, <laughs> no. My personal battery is good for another three hours. If you, um, the this is an ordinance pertaining to city trees, and this is to refer to uh, the Committee on Rules, Ordinance, Appointments, and Ordinances uh, Planning, and the Northampton Public uh, Shade Tree Commission for their first order of business. Second. Motions have made and seconded for referral. Any discussion on the referral? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? OK. I have no updates. There is no information requests. Uh, no, no new business. I'm not sure why public comments at the end of this. <laughs> I'm listed on the agenda. Motion to adjourn. Okay. There's been a motion made to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you all very much. Have a great night. Thank you.